Stugatz, I have a major, major local hour announcement. Wow. A major one. Now, Greg Cody is not here, of course. He promised to come in today and work hard and be good, and he is late, of course. We've waited long enough. So you will hear him at some point stumble into the room, hopefully breathless after climbing the <laughs> stairs, and hopefully he hijacks the show as he did last week. Well, he goes down the stairs on the way here, up the stairs on the way out, but he'll still be breathless, I promise you. Okay, yeah. so he takes the elevator when he gets here, and he's still breathless. <laughs> Very good. We've got some sound to get to, but before we do that, because this is a major announcement from Spittin' Chicklets on Twitter, mm. you need... You need your hockey news, right? If you're going to get hockey news, put it on the poll gear. My at Lebetard show are is the most credible source in hockey, quote unquote, spitting chicklets. It's them or Roy. Yeah, I don't feel like Roy is that credible. But Roy, if you love hockey, you should follow him. He does minutia and play by play during the games, <laughs> and I was very disappointed, like uh, he was that the Kraken took us out with an empty netter the other day to make it 5-3. to three. But this if, is the- If you want such gems as sends, dump it into the neutral zone, please follow at Roy Belly. <laughs> it, uh, it is very serious hockey commentary. There are no jokes. And then next thing you know, uh, the fight breaks out. Just like hockey, really. It's, uh, right, it's yeah. uh, just everything's going along. Everyone's fine. The and gloves then come off. And yeah. then 3-3 yeah. at the end of two, <laughs> yeah. followed by your mama blow it out your ass. That's right. <laughs> it's, it's, so that's, it's a slalom course of just, uh, weird, uh, just Roy. Okay. Yeah, just uh, come to me for the four checking. All right. You will get an analysis. There, there, you there. will know if the four checking is good or not by following Roy. That's right. Can I get to the major announcement, please? No. Because <laughs> I can't. Do you have something important to say about recent Panther play? Uh, yeah, they they were bad against Seattle, and they're going to play Winnipeg tomorrow, and then wow. the big homestand comes up. So ah, the big hopefully. Home stand. Yeah, so schedule home. talk. Straight Every schedule match. talk. You want to yeah. finish okay. it off with a flurry the way <laughs> you would normally finish these you things You wanted off. me not to get to the major announcement so you could really be a peacock and flourish with all your hockey knowledge, and you went straight to the schedule. You can't debate it, Dan. Everything he said is true. That is true. All right. Very good. Excellent. All right. Thank now you. you can get to your Thank important you, message. Roy, I, yeah. I thought he was going to say blow it out your yeah, ass. Please yeah, proceed yeah, to yeah. blow so it out your ass. No, you want me to say that to uh, to my uh, my boss? No, I don't think so. I don't know my well, job. He bowed. did tell him he couldn't talk. We did stop the show yeah, so that you could. told him he couldn't move on with the show. I, I, I <laughs> you think... gave us the schedule. At I that mean. point, you've already told, it, told me to blow it out my ass just more discreetly. That is true. Yeah, yeah. I was being nice about it. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> Let me get to the announcement, though, okay. because I imagine the audience is excited about this, and it was weird that you stopped me just to give the schedule of the upcoming Florida Panthers game. <laughs> it was important. Yeah. yeah, he mentioned that. A big homestand uh, in Ottawa. They're going to Ottawa as well. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big, yeah, it's a big two-game home two All right, you know what? Explain this to me, Roy, because I, I really do want to understand it, because I heard you and Stugatz talking the other day, and we have to own hockey in this town, and you have to own it, because we're headed into this team being important and mattering, and we need good hockey analysis around here, because Spittin' Chicklets is announcing on Twitter, that Jonathan Huberdeau has quietly become one of the league's biggest superstars. What? Oh! Yes. They're kind of late to that train, aren't they? Because I said that for the longest time. Okay, but now oh, exactly. Spinning Chicklets exactly. is saying it. Okay, you, you said it on your Twitter well, account yeah. between I created a hashtag with David Jork locally here. He Huby for heart. Yeah. I heard you. Should be hard for Huby. If you I say heard, so. I heard you and Stugatz. It's his hashtag. I mean. Talking about talking to Steve Goldstein. I want to own hockey in this market. You've got to own hockey in this market. I'm a credential media man with an You go to games, games and you eat a lot of chips and you tell there us about no chips. four checking. There are no chips. Goldie. And also, how about this? Because it's not just spitting chicklets on Twitter saying that Jonathan Huberdeau has quietly become one of the league's biggest superstars. Don't tell me someone else is saying Well, listen, it. no more. Wow. More. Oh, my God. Ryan Whitney is oh. saying that I'm he's spitting chicklets. Yeah, no, but this is right. No, but this is a different quote. This is different. Wow. It's not just that he's quietly become one of the league's biggest superstars, which is the headline. In the quote box, quietly. The biggest superstar in the league. 
Wait, what? The, that, the biggest, not one of the leagues, not merely like the biggest, not merely no that, not merely one of the league superstars. The Panthers have had one superstar ever. Pavel Burry never got out of the first round. Can you be the biggest superstar in the sport and not the biggest superstar in, on your own team? Well, you're going to have to take it up with spit and chicklets. <laughs> I don't. I'm saying that quietly, the biggest superstar in the league belongs to the Florida Panthers, who despite a weird 5-3 vic- uh, loss at Seattle where the forechecking was bad. Look at you. Looked like the best team in the league. <laughs> that was like, weird, man. Looked like the best team in the league. They swept us. Seattle swept us this season. That is weird, man. But, yeah, he leads the league in points. Like seriously, he's on a point streak right now. He is the super, he's the biggest superstar in the league right now. So what? yeah, yes, is he can very what? well win the Hart Trophy this season, which is the league MVP. Oh. Doesn't stardom require some level of noise? Because nah. I feel like there's a tangibility of obviously the quality of your play. You're a good player, but stardom requires transcending beyond how good you are at hockey. Nah, nah. I feel like Sidney Crosby's nah. a superstar. Said the kid. Well, here's like, the problem. It he he plays in Florida. That, that's the problem. Nobody has been paying attention to the Panthers games other than these past two years. Yeah. So when you're being ignored down here, obviously when somebody comes up, like Hubie has done, like it, it's a surprise to everybody now. But Florida is home to the number one sports podcast in the nation. If you're a true superstar, you join the Dan Levitard show. Not spinning checklists. The Dan Levitard show with Stu Gatt. Let's get him because I'm with Chris Whittingham and put it on the poll, please, Guillermo, at Levitard show. Does stardom require some level of noise? Because I don't think these things can exist in the same sentence. You can't be a superstar quietly. There is no such thing. There's well, like, not a quiet superstar? No, it's, there's no way to become famous, superstardom famous, quietly. It requires, as Whittingham said, some level of noise. So can we make it? Can we make it here? We have... Roar but not reach is what David Sampson has accused us of. Can we make a noise here? Can the show make a noise on behalf of Jonathan? A big national echoing noise on behalf of Jonathan Huberto. I think the problem is you can't find superstars in hockey. Well, I that, don't know about the that, noise but that's factor. Not, but that's not I mean, Sidney Crosby. He's not a superstar anymore. He's not. I mean, Sidney Crosby is not a superstar Okay, so anymore. how does this work? We're only going to be, because you can't find him in baseball either now, right? So superstars I are play only- football. I you, mean. you don't think Connor McDavid is a superstar? He could walk into this room right now, and I wouldn't know who he is. Connor McDavid? I've heard, I know the name. If he's in uniform, but right. if he walked in here out of uniform right now, I would be like, he's oh, fighter, oh, that's right? Connor McDavid? No, Connor McDavid. Oh, okay, but that, <laughs> are you would recognize how many hockey players over the last a bunch 15, of Panthers. 15 years? Not a lot. I mean, Sidney Crosby, I would know. He has a more distinct right. look. Ovechkin, I would know. <laughs> Outside of that, Ovechkin, I don't know. Ovechkin, dirty Ovechkin. Uh, he would look unshaven. I really think Huberdo though is oh, is over. It, the real story here is the Panthers as a team. This team is so much fun to watch. I have season tickets. I can't outside of the Big Three Heat and the Marlins in 03, I literally can't think of a time of having more fun watching and following a team. I am excited about every game. I put it on TV. I go to these games. I look forward to them. I'm legitimately excited about this team and like going to the playoffs. Chris knows more about hockey than Roy. No, I'm, That's I'm what just I just learned. No, yeah. uh, what? Chris is the voice of hockey I'm really this time just, right now. I'm really nope, just it's Chris. I think oh, I am Chris. a voice for the enthusiasm the that the yeah. casual like they've gotten me. I think you should immediately move into Roy's neighborhood yeah, and right. gentrify it. Well, I mean, if we want to no. go line for line, I could name almost no, every guy. I'm on saying, the what I'm right saying now. is your analysis because I want to go line. Roy is not bringing what I'm at. What I am trying to exact from Roy is give the people some entertainment when you're out there tweeting. And if you want this space, Chris, come grab it. Come well, grab it from Roy. He's been working hard here for years, and it would be perfect if you just came in and you stole it, it from him because he's eating chips. It is fair criticism um, on that part because I used to make fun of my dad. He would be live tweeting a Dolphins game, and his tweets would just be, the Dolphins just scored at 7-7. And I was like, Dad, give us commentary on that. Don't just like report that. what's happening. And and I, I think like it that. I think it's fair criticism of Roy. Like, I don't know who you're serving in those instances where you're just saying what happened in I the game. I like that. I've been given criticism. Like, 
I lit them up last uh, the night no, before. No, no, I'm not. But I'm just saying I would just only do that. I would say that the tweets that's like it's three three at the end of two. I'm, I'm just like you don't have. I'm just you can say that. Roy has turned around furious can, because you are now threatening his I'm neighborhood. I'm just saying that I would. You're you know, Johnny come lately. You're Cody come lately. Are you doing that for the people that aren't watching? Like people that might. I like, appreciate it because there are times where I'm not watching and I get an alert that Roy sent a tweet out and it updates me on the score. I mean, I like well, it. Well, let's Roy. get the expert tweeter here who has come in a little bit breathless. I, I have Roy set to alerts and I Thank couldn't. You know, Contain my excitement when I saw Bob pulled for the extra attacker. Oh, you nice gotta get that in quickly, though. <laughs> it, it was Roy, nice to know. Thank Roy, you. Yeah. Say you know something what? provocative about the Panthers here, wow. if you can. Well, All wait right? a minute. Don't push him into wow. this. No, no. Yeah, yeah. Fuck Mary Kill, Barkov, Thornton, <laughs> and Hornquist. You, you want me to murder a oh, of Panther? I'm not. Just say I'm not something gonna. horny. No, Anton Lundell should be Great. considered more of a candidate for the Calder Trophy yes. for Rookie oh. of the Year. That, that's why I believe. How old is he? 20? Nobody so better so nobody better at face-offs than that 20-year-old. And he's sick at uh, shootouts. Whoa. Nobody better. I think he's better Bill than Bart. Look, Chris yeah, is Bill coming for him. your stuff. Roy, is he not better at shootouts this so, year than Bart? Roy, Chris is coming for your uh, stuff. Hold on I wouldn't say so. I would have yeah, a run out of Sasha Bach off. Guys, here. some order, please. So Chris and Roy. Fuck, marry, or kill that person. I'm, 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 not, I'm not murdering. I'll play it. Who is it? Barky, Horny, and who? You'll play it. So Chris I'll, is I'll marry willing. Barky. Well, He's got Chris, that big see, bag. Chris got that big willing. bag. Chris Whoa. Cody is willing to do what it takes so that you guys can again be in front of that tunnel when they come out, leading out a playoff charge instead of when we went, which was before any of this had arrived, <laughs> this enthusiasm for this hockey team. And Jonathan Huberdo. Hoobie. Hadn't quietly become a superstar, but we've passed the threshold. It is being alleged the Panthers have a superstar. That's only happened once. Am I wrong? Van Beesbrook does not count during the Beezer. The, that they've only had one. It was Pavel Burry, and it wasn't even him. It was because he was dating Anna Kornikova. Oh, you shut your mouth. It was oh. definitely because of the he Russian was great rock at on, he was man. great at hockey, but I'm talking about crossing over into America, pop culture, hockey making its way down into the into Florida. This was this was before she was is she still married he, he to Enrique a, he, Iglesias? He, he was an all star. He was lighting the lamp. He was incredible. And he made his he was name. Mike, Mike, he was Mike Trout. Dan, he made his name with the Vancouver Canucks in their Stanley Cup run when they lost to the Rangers. He was a megastar, and Anna Kornikova got more shine off of him. Mike you are not going Don't to Don't you come for the Russian Rock. He's an me. EA Sports legend as well. 100%. Yes. I'm not saying that he was not a great scorer and superstar in his league, but he was confined to his sport before he started dating Kornikova. He could not get into the tabloids and some of that stuff you need. It's what I'm talking about with Whittingham here. It's what I'm talking about with hockey. I mean, does fame require a noise? A level of noise. Uh, the only one I have seen, in, in, and this was back when baseball was this, was Vladimir Guerrero. But how much noise is Mike Trout even making now? Baseball can't even do it. There are no Jeters anymore. Baseball, Man, if Aaron Judge and Giancarlo Stanton looking the way they do can't do it in New York, it can't be done. I don't know, you know, Bryce Harper personality. I don't know who the baseball, I, Tatis, I mean, I, I love watching him, but I, I think that window is closed on baseball. And it's been closed on hockey in America for a long time. Gretzky was trying to open it a million years ago. But it's been closed in America. You can't be hockey famous in this country. Not really. The great one. Is A-Rod still the biggest baseball star? I mean, wow. he's not even playing anymore. I think he is. It's definitely not I Trout. I can tell you, you that much. Would you care to answer it? Or you just want to be the peanut gallery shouting in the mask? I'm just wow, supporting great from, question. Yeah, no, I'm supporting from the back. We still haven't finished the game, but I don't, I'm not here to I'll play. Take the I'm going to marry murder. Barky. I'm going to kill Joe Thornton. Wow. Wow. And I'm going to wow. fuck Hornquist. Oh, my God. Wow. Wow. Why are Horny. you killing Jumbo? Wow. I mean, he gave me three options. I got to kill careful. one of them. Well, be careful. And don't you got to fuck one of them, right? Yeah. yeah. I'll mean Horny. Yeah. That guy's aggressive on that. I think he'd be fun. It is aggressive. Horny, that you are really this Roy. I'm I'm shocked by what's happened here because you have been a now Roy. Fan. Now Roy plays. Yeah. Well, Roy, Roy, for nobody doesn't want to play and he no. wants to sit it out. And this is not the way no. to make a mark in the media business. In this, I'm he's telling got, you, he's got to go to a locker room and no, look horny in the eyes after he goes public with, "I'm going to fuck horny." I think you need to go and make some content, Chris. The last time you broke into the arena, too. That's another thing. If we want to drop bona fides, I almost made the roar team. Yeah, Roy. Uh, wow. congratulations! Wow. Check out that video on YouTube. Wow. Okay, <laughs> Roy. Uh, I'm, I, am I 
creating controversy that does not exist here because we are headed into a playoff run when we are going to bore the holy hell out of the audience with uh, with Hockey Panther talk. I don't like that we're like Roy and I are being pinned against yeah, each other. Like we're all just a couple You're Cats fans. We're just Cats fans over here. Some cans. A couple of Cats fans cutting it up. That's right. Yeah. Are you okay, Greg? You're oh, coughing, great. laughing. We haven't. Nobody oh, knows hi, that you've been here for hey. five oh, minutes. Hey. Well, thank you. I know you're pu <laughs> you're punishing me for being late. I get that. I'm in the penalty box to uh, join the 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 metaphor what? here. It's not. We Which just Panther started. would you fuck? We just started. <laughs> you know, my hockey knowledge is just hold on. Let, the it, roof. let it sit for a second. I didn't let it sit either, but it's just let it sit. What happened? I don't know. Did you not hear what he asked you? No, I didn't. He asked you to announce to America, and I think it's important <laughs> now that we get an answer to this right. question. As the patriarch and father to Chris Cody on entertainment, on how to get attention, on how to be a media star, right. because you're not just giving, hey, 2-2 two, two, second period. Yeah. You're giving people fire and gas. Sure. So in a way that I'd like to get aggregated nationally, the question posed to you by Stugatz ever so delicately because he's so subtle. <laughs> Which Florida Panther would Greg Cody fuck? Yeah. Or most want to? That's a very good question. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go Barky. Yeah, Alexander. Sasha. Barkov. When I'm doing it, I got to call him Sasha. He's a good two-way player. <laughs> Silky trophy winner. Three-way from what I've heard. Um, Great with the stick. Yeah, he is. No, he's a beautiful player. Uh, him and Uberdo are the two stars on the team. They don't have a superstar through no fault of their own. Because as you've been saying, superstar needs to transcend market and even sport. But in terms of on the ice and the way they play, they have two superstars. Those two stars. In hockey, there's not a lot of guys that are going to reach that level of fame. But as far as just on the ice, the way they play, they have two superstars, for sure. But in terms of fame, we can have that argument. It doesn't matter. We're entering, this is, what I'm telling you here, that Spittin', Spittin Chicklets has announced, and what I'm telling you, this is the announcement. This is why I'm I'm stunned. Stugatz is still sitting it out. He's not he's not here. We haven't grabbed him by the meat nipples and like really shaken him up. <laughs> the Florida Panthers, by virtue of having two superstars and what looks like the most fun offense and best team in the league, have arrived firmly in the conversation. Meat nipples. <laughs> You are right, though. It was just Barky before. We had one star, and now we have two. Thank you, Spittin' Chickens. Is that no. Chicklets? Uh, chicklets. Chicklets. Spittin chickens. Chickens. Spittin Why would you want to spit a chicken? I, that right now, I want to eat I a chicken. I'm hungry. That. I want you and Adnan to create a spinoff podcast this week that is not cinephile, but is Spittin' Chickens. Yep. Done. <laughs> Poultry website. Spitting chickens. I want you to do a totally uh, a movie uh, movie podcast themed only on chicken related scenes in the movie. Well, obviously, Rocky, one of Stugatz's favorites, oh, the best, is going to make an appearance in the Hall of Fame. Brandon Montour is the guy I would fuck. Really? Oh, he good is. shout. Thank good you. Good shout. Thank you. Not Mackenzie mm -hmm. Weger. No, no, no. Ooh, the oh, long hair. I oh, announced my guy. Look at Roy, not Mackenzie Weger. Look at you <laughs> playing the game. I'm not playing any Roy, game. I'm throwing out some chickens. Roy, you got Roy, you got lured into the game. Everyone saw. Yep. You did. You did. We got the God luscious it. lettuce. Roy, you Roy likes the luscious lettuce. <laughs> You are not an aggressive lover, but his hair lure, or luscious lettuce, as Chris <laughs> described it, has lured you luridly into the bedroom. We heard it. All of us heard it together. Mike Ryan, we have spent 15 minutes talking about hockey, and we should because this is another thing. 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, oh God. 27, 28, this is about me. 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34 tweets. In your Twitter account's history about the neutral zone. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, you got to get around that neutral zone trap. Well, Roy, yeah, we're we're going to need to create some entertainment around your hockey coverage, whatever it is. If you want to host uh, something on Twitter spaces with Steve Goldstein, we need to dominate this area because I want to, in, in, 
The most fun I've ever had doing this in sports was the earliest, earliest incarnations of the Marlins and the Heat when I was introducing these players into a community, like their personalities and stuff, their, their humanity. So they weren't just a team. And then you can go on the run with people you felt like you knew. Cody, you know this. Like this is the best work that the Miami Herald did along this path was introduce a community to to sports that way. But here are the personalities who play this. And hockey's only given it to us once. It gave it to us a million years ago. Mike Ryan doesn't want us to talk about those glory days anymore. But we're headed into them right now. People who care about hockey know that this team is is like, holy shit, they're young and strong and fast, and they want to come for everybody. Like, they, they might not. They might lose in the first round again because they run into the champions. But we, but we want to be the show that introduces them I believe to America because no one else is going to do it. I feel like we hear this about the Panthers like every three years, no, and then they lose no, in like the no, first or second different. round, and that's but the this end of that. year. This is different. But this though. year, it's Roy, always different. Correct me if I'm wrong. It's they're the Chiefs different. in terms of they're the fun offense. They're the team. If hey, who's the team that you want to watch in the league that scores like crazy? They're that team. Well, they lead the league. They lead the league in goals scored. They have, they're going to end up with double digit players with double digit goals this season. So it's going to be it's a lot of fun to watch. When's the they last time the Panthers? Chris When's the last time we had a team down here? It was the big three in terms of the last time we were the team. But this is the thing now. What I was about to say to you is you got two. Now you got two because during the pandemic, the Heat are proudest of this. And I know the audience is tired of that culture talk. But when the apocalypse arrived, they had players to endure it because this isn't the team. The team that's at the top of the conference is not the team that's headed into the playoffs. The team has not played together at all. But there, I don't know that there's been a greater tribute to what it is the Pat Riley and the Heat want to be about on the culture stuff than even during apocalypse, a pandemic, we could keep throwing guys out there. And Monty Williams and Doc Rivers are saying, well, who the hell's that guy? Right. Where'd they get him? At, at, Doc Rivers is saying, it pisses me off. Yurtsevin, they're not even going to have a place to put that guy once the playoffs start. <laughs> like, because De because they discovered Deadman, and you're, like, falling in love with him. And Deadman's the guy that's playing. So I, But Struess... Struess has is, is found his way. It's they're, they're using him as a closer, and this is the competitive competition in the huddle. Like, And I love this part because you get to watch this part too. Duncan just got paid, but Struess wants what Duncan does. If the job is just to shoot threes, and Jimmy Butler says of Duncan, shoot 16 threes. We don't care whether you go 0 for 16 or you go 8 for 16. That's your job. Just, just shoot threes. But tell me Struess doesn't want what Duncan has. I think Struess is going to take it. In fact, he, he's taking the, the clutch time. It's so hard to extrapolate exactly who's in what role just because the lineups have been so different. But, no, Duncan has unfortunately played himself into an expendable role. It's not just on him, to be fair. It's on how good Struess was. I'm pretty certain that Jimmy Butler would be upset if Duncan went 0 for 16 from 3. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that wouldn't last long. What's weird is he's a, he's a bizarro player. He's so much worse at home. <laughs> So much worse. If but, you see those home road splits, it's it's jaw dropping. Let me ask you guys this question: If you're saying to me that I'm sure Jimmy Butler would be furious with Duncan Robinson if he goes 0 for 16 from three, uh, Jimmy Butler is four for 27 from three in all late game situations. I can't do it. Can't do it. Don't want him doing it. Please don't shoot threes ever. You can't. We don't want you shooting from out there. You, you, I, I, to push back on that notion a little bit. He's also, I think, top three in getting foul calls, and that's a scoring play too. That doesn't count towards oh, your field goal. But attempt. I'm just saying, is he qualified? Is Jimmy? You say, oh, Jimmy Butler would be furious with Duncan Robinson. I'm just saying, it's coming from the worst three point shooter on the team to be furious with Duncan Robinson for not being able yeah. to do something that he can't do. But Duncan Robinson is specifically played for, uh, paid for that one thing, paid and played, to do that one thing. Jimmy Butler, as, as we've come to love him, he's a jack-of-all-trades. He can do pretty much everything outside of shoot consistently from the outside, and you know you've seen it in a playoff series. He can light it up for a couple of games, and it'll just be puzzling that way. But Jimmy Butler is kind of inheriting the mantle that Dwayne Wade had, which is the guy you trust with the ball, but not the guy you want shooting the big three at the end of the game. Jimmy Butler, in his time in Miami, is a 24% three-point shooter. You don't want him taking threes in those situations, but he's also the guy that you have to give the ball to and in some ways allow for the irrational confidence to be like, hey, I'm going to make the shot at the end of the game, but it's not what you want, but it's 
what you're going to get probably come playoff time. I'm getting bogged down here. I just think Jimmy Buckets, after he goes 0 for 12, would probably tell Duncan, hey, enough threes. Like, stop shooting the stop shooting the basketball. All right? Let me ask you this. As LeBron James gives profound respect while he was here in a way that I haven't heard since he left, just talking about – I've heard some of it, but not all in one place where he was talking this much, not just feeling himself, but he's doing a little bit of nostalgia, LeBron is now, right? As he comes through the old high school or whatever where he grew up and and became a man and as he feels his mortality in Los Angeles because he can't help but notice – the threats are all here, and they're flooding the king's palace. Like, he sees he sees it. He might still be great, but he's looking around, and he's like, oh, my God, there's so many people out here who can regularly beat me. Yeah, he's because, old. Uh, he's gotten old. Yeah, but he's, but, he, but he's still, playing well. But still great, but still great. But what he's got, it is obvious. It's got to be obvious to him. It's not good enough, and he knows it because he knows what it takes to be that kind of good, and he's making the nostalgic tour through Miami. He gets drubbed. He has a great game. They try to come back late. We didn't even talk any about this because football just drowned it. And then after the game, he's talking about Jimmy Butler and how much respect he's always had for Jimmy Butler, the way that Jimmy Butler – tries to play hard every play, every game, and just meeting competitive fire with competitive fire. I ask you this as he comes through here and Mike begs for the heat to trade for him just to make it more fun so we could hold on to the last embers. I was just throwing that uh, that concept out there, and I've gotten some slow and steady buy-in. And LeBron <laughs> did the thing yesterday on IG. What was that? What was that? City. Yeah, wow. it's it's starting the fire. My city. And like, how many <laughs> cities? How many cities have been my city for LeBron James? <laughs> Precisely three. I'll be your city. Same as Wade. I'll be your city. You guys want him? Mike's throwing it out there. That's he can have the I'll city. Be a city. Yeah. That is. Cl- for, well, what do you have to give up? You got to give up Bam. You got to give. What do you got to give Bam up? Bam and Duncan. Boom. Yeah. Let's go. Really? That's you do it. it right now, Mike. Wait a minute, Contracts what are you saying? Chris, up. what are you ma- saying really? You Bam's wanna- good. Okay. Bam's he's younger. Yeah. Bam's All right, good. Yurt's have been straight up, even though the contracts are a little off. I, I'm, yeah, let's throw yeah. in like six you're, you're guys. Let's guy? keep Bam oh, and Jimmy right, and throw in six guys. That's right. That's Duncan. Who else? Come on, we can do that. Who are the next six Deadman. guys? No, Struz is loose, Dan. I don't know if you know this. Throwing the entire bench. How sports radio is Chris Dan and the mechanic. Yes, please give me LeBron, but I don't. You're your dad. I don't want to give up anything. Exactly. I'm sorry, right. I don't want to give a Bam out of bio for a guy that might retire next season. That's right. I'm I'm, I'm a he's fool. He's not going to retire. retire. He's, he's not he's retiring. Had like 15, 20 sh- game. He leads the league in 30 plus point games. He seems tired of it. Yeah. Look at his face. He's over you ever it. just look at LeBron yeah. and be like, you, you have you have big plans. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You don't want this anymore. The complimenting uh, Jimmy Butler and all that stuff. He's evolving into the elder statesman role. He's transitioning into retirement. He's on an elder statesman tour it right now. Like, but it wasn't He's like near he, the end. But it wasn't like he mm-hmm. just brought up Jimmy Butler and he was having this moment. Ethan Skolnick specifically asked him about Jimmy Butler. Oh, I understand. No, but I'm uh, LeBron. This is what I wanted to go back on the entire history of it, right? Because this is where sports fandom started for a lot of South Florida, and they learned for the first time the us against Miami thing that has been down here since those old hurricanes. LeBron came through this town and became for. I mean, treated Miami the way a lot of people do have sex with it, enjoy the great time here, and then move on to your more serious relationships. And it was a great time. It was a giant party. It's it was the, the most, best time. It's the most fun yeah. this show has ever had, all of us, as we enter this new place where Chris is asking you, Chris Cody is is saying, hey, I want to pay attention to the Panthers. Uh, and we've got two teams in this town that are going to make runs. They're going to be interesting. And, man, we've had a lot of losing down here. Good God, man. It's 20 years the Dolphins stink. Marlins betray you. Losing's more fun though for what we do, oh, honestly. Oh, okay. Yeah, losing a lot more fun for what we do than winning. <laughs> Wait, for what so we do, that's you. Point. Well, we no, but we've talked about this before. It's either be great or be awful. Just yes. don't be what they've been. Uninteresting in between. Right. All of them except for the Heat. Yeah, don't be seven and nine, nine and seven. That's the that's worst. what's death, and that's what we've had for twenty years. But it made us a national show. Like it made us the inability to keep it interesting on shitty, uninteresting teams for twenty years is what made us a national show. Because we had to find other things to talk about. The most interesting thing is having expectations to win and then losing. Like 2011. Like the the two months that followed the Heat losing that finals was right. as interesting as nah. it gets in South Florida. Nah. You get, Listen, guys. Let's all be honest. You were all tired of the big three at the end of it. What? 
it's the truth, and I'll tell you how I know it's the what truth. They were exhausting. I'll tell I'm you with how Billy. I know they were exhausting. I'll tell yeah. you exactly how I know it's the truth. That year, I went to probably 20 games with Dan season tickets because no one wanted them anymore. To- they <laughs> fell to me every single time. I was like, who wants to go to the game today? Roy said, no, nah, I don't want to go. Mike didn't want to go. That time. Chris didn't want no I one sold wanted mine. to go. And I'm like, this is great. I'm here. It's like, whoa, I'm living a high life here as a, you know, barely over an intern status. It was great. But everyone was tired of the big three. I mean, I went to some of those games. I think and I nationally, went. everyone was tired of the big three, too. You and I sat next to Marlon's man in one of those yes, games. Out of uniform, that? Marlon's man. Oh. He was, you had, like, what, eighth row or something? It was, And that was not good enough. He's like, I can't be in my Marlon's jersey in the eighth row. Camouflage Marlon's <laughs> man. Yeah, showing his cell phone with people great. bragging about who he was hanging he out with. He is exactly what you think he is during a game. <laughs> he sure Just is. Just work in the room. He's never watching the game. He didn't sit still. He kept getting up and walking around, talking to security people, trying to get closer. He's just looking at who's looking at him. That's what he's doing. It was great. That was better than the game. Just sitting next to Marlon's man, listening to his conversation. We didn't talk to him once. No. He's drunk. We were reporting, and now we're giving our report seven years later. I don't believe this is, <laughs> but I don't think this is journalistically ethical, what you're doing, overhearing a conversation yes. with Marlon yes, man. Is. Marlon's man didn't shout, off the record, before he started talking <laughs> to people. Right. Can Marlon's man wants you to listen in to his conversations. He's saying it with a purpose. Yes. Yes. Everything's done by design with that right. guy. He'd have a microphone if they allowed him to bring it into the arena. I'm surprised he doesn't have a podcast. What do you think he'd talk we about? Him yeah. Himself. Yeah, we should give him one. Yeah, himself. Yeah. Spitting chickens. <laughs> <laughs> We're entering a fun and interesting time in South Florida sports, and we've had precious few of them. I was surprised. I don't know if you guys were. I was legitimately surprised to see that Jimmy Butler now passed LeBron all-time career triple doubles in as a member of the Miami Heat. It's a random thing, but I didn't think that he could take that from LeBron that quickly. He hasn't been here that long and he misses a lot of games. So I was anyone else surprised by that because I would have just if you'd asked me to guess, I would have said that I wouldn't have cared. I wouldn't have known what the number was, but I would have guessed that LeBron is the all-time leader in triple doubles for the Miami Heat. I'm surprised by it, but the thing I'm most surprised about with Jimmy Butler is he's the best guy in a team that's the best team in the East. Like, that's the surprising thing to me, because when he came oh, here, no, no one thought he no, could be but that. No, but please, this, is, this season is not representative of Jimmy Butler. This season is representative of when the apocalypse came, They all the pieces fit, and the Miami Heat somehow got to the top of something that not even Brooklyn could withstand. Like, that's what they're proud of as a, as a team. We'll bring soldiers through here. Man, Pat Riley's nuts. He's crazy. Do you realize to be working as hard as he is, just crazed and maniacal about I need to get this thing right so that whenever my life is done, not my life in basketball, my life is done, I've left this in the shape that it can withstand stuff. Like he's sitting here hanging on to the very end of his career, still working way too much, way too much. And here is where it pays They have guy after guy, bandage after bandage, literally guy, a guy named guy that you will not (laughs) see when the playoffs start very much at all, probably, because if they're healthy, they want to be, it's, it's, it's the team he's built. That's got a very small window. It's Jimmy Butler's window. It's Kyle Lowry's window. And he wants to leave it secure so that it can be this for 10 years. So that Tyler Hero and Bam Adebayo can be the future of the sport. And Pat Riley can leave with this thing in a place at some point, if he ever leaves, where it feels like it's in good hands, no matter if it's Spolster running it. Well, that's just it. Uh, A a great part of Riley's legacy right now is that he's leaving everything in the hands of a performance artist on the bench. Because Spolster is able to take all these disparate parts— and make them work. He's able to have Jimmy Butler and Bam Adebayo together miss half of the first half of the season, and yet here they are fighting for the top of the East. A lot of that is Spolstra and and his ability to take all these parts and all these situations and make them mesh. That's the story of this season is Spo. I think he finally gets his coach of the year this season. Having the record he has without his two stars is crazy. But not to be like the rain cloud, but does any of this matter? Like the one seed if you don't get things done in the playoffs? Because 
the records, I mean, every team has had so many people out because of injuries or because of the COVID. Well, this is what, I, what so I'm like, saying. I is, think it matters for this but team. What yeah. I'm, but it's not yeah. It's not really representative of where they are. At, at all, it's not. And I would say to you that it's, it's only a tribute to them symbolically and spiritually as – but this is not just the idea that they could keep it afloat and have it be good when no one else can. Guys, it's not it's hard. We have taken for granted how relevant this Heat team has been throughout Pat Riley's entire tenure. Atlanta comes and goes. You know, Budenholzer wins 61 games for Atlanta and then they retreat. They don't win any playoff games. Everyone comes and goes. Look at Atlanta this year. Look at the Knicks this year. With R.J. Barrett, yep. top 15 in jersey sales because that town is so desperate for please give us something. We haven't had shit since Riley left. Please give us something to to feel good about with New York. Were the Hawks in the Eastern Conference Finals last year? I mean, they're not even a playoff team right now. This is what I'm yeah. telling you. And the Knicks are sub 500, right? Or they're, they're, they're sub 500 after being in the middle. It's hard to stay up here. Knicks it's, are two games under 500. My point is... We've underestimated. Sacramento's been trying to get up from Chris Webber and Stojakovic for 25 goddamn years. We underestimate how hard it is for them to do what it is that they've done, which is force their way into the conversation, no matter how much the sport evolves. I think you're also underestimating exactly how much roster turnover there was. I understand singing Spolstra's praises, and I'll be first in line to say coach of the year, but... There were a lot of bad players on this roster last year that got totally blown out. Do you remember Brizlika, Avery Bradley, Ariza, Harkless, Iggy, Fine. Ken, like Kendrick Nunn? They've added P.J. Tucker, who Spo absolutely loves. Kyle Lowry, remember last year got pretty nuked by COVID too. And they were just, I think, eight games over 500 and had a first-round matchup with the eventual NBA champions. They dealt with a lot of COVID stuff last year too. They've navigated it better this year because they got better players. They blew out some of the older players, had more tread on their tires that weren't exactly great fits. They developed youngsters, and you're seeing a much better player. Growth and development of Tyler Hero as well matters. I I, I think we're o- underestimating exactly what the front office did here too. But for me, it's also the, – the, you mentioned those young players. That's not just a throwaway line. That's I was watching the Lakers game on Sunday night, and – at one point, it's Bam Adebayo on the floor with Caleb Martin, Kyle Guy, Max Struess, and Gabe Vincent. And they're staring the Lakers. LeBron is on the floor. Yeah. And the Heat are sustaining a 20-point lead with those guys this, on the floor. This is what they I'm, just <laughs> manufacture these guys. This is what I'm telling you about. It's, it's the end, right? Belichick and Brady, the pie chart. It's the end of, of this and LeBron's on Instagram saying, put me with MJ and Brady. And he's on the nostalgia tour. And he is learning now, ah, they did have something to do with my success. I also am eternally great. So maybe I win one in Cleveland. And maybe I win one with the Lakers. I, maybe I can build it myself. But when Pat Riley's being flown across the country to recruit LeBron back to Miami and they won't turn the soccer off of the television and they won't take their feet off of the desk as he's trying to do a show for them on trophies with Andy Ellisberg in the hallway and rings like, hey, let me recruit these guys and make them feel wanted. And they're like, nope, we're going to take over the league. Their decision was made before they got into that room. They flew Riley across the country. Embarrassing. He was embarrassed by that. His ego took an enormous hit on that. He lost the guy, the guy who was going to keep him there for 10 years, and maybe he wouldn't have to work as hard to find a guy. Maybe he wouldn't have to go. It's what I told you Magic wasn't going to do. He wasn't going to sit on a cold bench in Kansas watching a freshman. Like he just that's not that's not who Magic is anymore, but Magic was birthed by Riley. Magic, Riley and Magic, that time in sports in Hollywood, it's going to be depicted now in HBO. Magical time. Pat Riley's in the middle of it and sustaining through Los Angeles, New York, and Miami. Always keeping it in the conversation. Give the credit to whoever you want. Front office, Spo, whatever else. But he stole Riley from the Knicks. Arison stole Riley. It took yep. all sorts of penalties. And what happened the next 25 years is Riley gave this town the same thing he gave New York. There are books written about the Knicks now from Riley's time. And gave it the same thing he gave in Los Angeles. That's three stops, man. That's, that's crazy. Like Phil Jackson didn't want to work like that. He got to the Knicks, took a paycheck, couldn't do it. That's nuts, that level of success. And here it is again, 
and they haven't even shown you in their playoff team. Like those guys have played like 17 minutes together this yeah. season. You still haven't seen Oladipo or Marquis right. Morris, really. If you could have one team make a deep run, the Panthers or the Heat, we all agree we would want Panthers. a hockey run, right? Panthers, Panthers. absolutely. Yeah. Panthers the Panthers. Run. Yeah. Yes. Panthers run. Yeah. Because score. they haven't done it. Yeah, it's more right. unique. Look, they haven't made There's it. There's nothing like a hockey run. They haven't made it. five years ago, they did it once. Right. They haven't made it past the first round since 96. Yeah. And if they fail to do so again, Roy will do the Cisco. I, I, yeah, I will. I've agreed to that. My hair is going to change color. I will I not think, be singing think, the thong song. Though. I think we need to escalate that and make the stakes between you and Chris. If this team doesn't advance, somebody's actually got to fuck a panther. An actual panther. Yeah. yeah. You got to catch one first. <laughs> yeah. You're endangered, careful. Yeah, Fifi. Zoom hug. Give me a Zoom hug. I don't feel like it was Fifi. I believe Amici. We're happy to see him. And we're genuinely curious how you're doing because America, the world is getting battered. Your whatever hope or optimism, even the psychological professor spirit that you carry around, like it's wearying, John. We're losing. You're losing. You realize that. Your quest for decency and equality, you are losing, no matter how graceful you try to be. In your country, in our country, led by racist leaders as you write books clamoring for leadership. So we ask you genuinely, how are you doing? Are you okay? I am, uh, I am exhausted. I'm exhausted, but I am incredibly privileged. And so my exhaustion is an indulgence at this point. Um, I would point out to you this. Uh, evil always looks like it's winning. The nature of evil is, and its downfall ultimately, is its incredible need to be right right now. Its incredible need to be, like, to win tomorrow. This is the this is the thing with evil. Because it needs to win now, it impress on you its 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 power now. It never has the strategic outlook to actually be victorious in the long term. Think of any dynasty you'd like of. I mean, <clears throat> the British Empire is a really good example, right? We were winning. There wasn't any possibility that we would lose our stranglehold, literally, on two-thirds of the world. And then one day, gone. So, you know, whether it's cowardly senators or <clears throat> uncommonly indecent tech bros, it doesn't really matter. They're going to lose. And not because good always prevails, because that's not true, but because evil has a habit of just not thinking strategically. It doesn't look like it's losing right now, though, because one of the things that you must find uncommonly wearying is someone who's just clamoring for decency. Just, I mean, it's such a bare minimum ass tolerance, such a, such a useless word. Can you just tolerate me? And at every turn, it's like, fuck off. No. No, I can't even tolerate you. Like, the selfishness, everything, the, the choosing of the dollar as we literally destroy the earth in a way that can't be ignored is terrifying, John. Terrifying. It, it's disappointing. Um, it, the, the, there does come a point where you can no longer be... Um, you can't be afraid for long periods of time. You know, there's tons of experiments that have been done with lots of different types of people where they've exposed them to fear for a period of time. And then there comes a point where you just, you can't be afraid. There's not enough chemicals left in your body. So you just, you have to think, what else can I do? And, you know, we are led by uh, little Scandinavian girls who, who are telling us that the earth is, is burning and they are making a difference we're led by lots of people who at the grassroots are making a difference. I, I am the, you know, I'm the doomsayer. I come on here and I, I uh, nag and regress and all the, but they can't win. You know, these, these people who insist that the color of a person's skin or their country of origin will forever determine their potential and, and, and how well perceived they are, they can't win. These people who think the presence of a transgender athlete will destroy it all, they can't win. They can make a huge amount of noise right now, like messy toddlers 
with ice cream all over their face and sticky stuff that you don't know where it's come from all over their hands. But they can't win. They can't. You sound more hopeful than it feels right now as you're confronted at every turn, not just with ignorance and hate and racism, but selfishness. Uh, John, I don't know what you thought the last decade was going to be, but I vastly underestimated, vastly, <laughs> vastly underestimated the race problems in this country and in yours and around the world and vastly, vastly underestimated that democracy and freedom could this quickly come under duress, peril, and be this fra <clears throat> this fragile, where I feel I'm in the—I'm sitting in the middle of I may soon lose freedom. That is a particularly American concern. It, it is not that I don't think freedom is important, but—, but Americans have weaponized the, the phrase freedom more than any other. Democracy, is it under threat? Yes. Has it been under threat since senators and, and politicians in general in America and Britain, really what they should have when, you know, in Britain you see them in the, in the lovely um, parliament in the Houses of Commons and, and Lords, you see them in their suits, but what you should really see them in is like those racing car driver uniforms, you know, the ones that are plastered with badges of sponsors everywhere. That's really what you should see when you look at your senators and politicians, because that's what it is. It's not It's not a positive. I, I think it's deeply troubling. I resist. I support causes that I think will fight against it. But I just, what people want, what evil wants is for good people to believe that apathy is the correct response. That's what evil really wants. For those of us who would muster our resources to be targeted and strategic in the way we fight back, the way we speak up, they want us to believe that it's futile and that what we should do is shut up. And so I have realized that I have contributed to some people feeling like it is futile to resist and it is not. Resistance is not futile. What happened, John, that births Donald Trump and Boris Johnson? Oh, well, I mean, they're not new phenomena. I mean, Donald Trump and Boris Johnson are particularly clownish, but they're not new phenomena. The idea that someone who, uh, I, I don't know if you know this, but Boris Johnson, when he was in, in, in school at Eton, his headmaster, uh, his report card became public, one of his report cards, and... The headmaster essentially said, describe the man he is today, a person who thought that the rules didn't really apply to him, who thought that he should accelerate at an ever-increasing pace through life and achieve everything that he thought he deserved without putting in any effort. And that, that, is, that kind of unearned privilege, that, that kind of arrogance of station defines people like Donald Trump and Boris Johnson people who love to tell you the story about how they're self-made, but forget the bit about their father giving them $3 million. Forget the bit about the school that they went to that no one else could have gone to and the privilege that that earned them, the Bullingdon Club that they were a part of. Do you, do you know the Bullingdon Club when Boris Johnson was there? It's a, it's, a, it's a posh kind of posh blokes. Within a very posh environment, it's the poshest of the posh blokes. They used to have something that they do when they walk through the streets, if they ever found themselves a rough sleeper, someone who was homeless, they would walk up to that person with a wad of cash. And as they looked to hand it over to this person, great gratitude in that person's eyes, they would burn it in front of them. This kind of man is not new. This kind of man is a petulant man-child with privilege oozing out of every gross poor but I refuse to let someone I hold in such contempt both Trump and Johnson I refuse to let somebody I hold in such contempt kind of neuter my enthusiasm for the fact that I think the world can be better and I think there are enough people who believe that too Speaking to that, you mentioned something in passing there, and I don't think this is being covered a lot in the mainstream media, the weaponizing of a transgender athlete, 
breaking records at Penn, a man, formerly a man, uh, swimming as a woman and just the assault. A woman swimming. A woman swimming. Uh, yes, understood. But you understand how this stuff gets weaponized. And I you, do. And but it, it's because it's, it, you know, it's, it's stupid. The percentage of transgender people in the world is so small, so shockingly small that to focus on that group is in and of itself a signal that people are reaching to try and find ways to polarize. Uh, you know, uh, what I love m more than this is the fact that uh, we're talking about women's sport here. And everybody in this room knows that despite the fact that we all know utterly remarkable athletes who are women, utterly remarkable women who I, I certainly, my career is owed to a woman who was uh, Susan Robinson, who was a, uh, an All-American at Penn State. She was just amazing. The spin move that kind of loosely kept me even viable for the NBA is something that she taught me. And it was a good spin move. It was your 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 spin. Look, man, you could put up 13 points in a quarter with that spin move. It wasn't very guardable. You put a big hip on somebody, and and then you 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 could do it. Like it's okay. Yeah. A woman taught you yeah. that. Yes, yes, she did. And 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 I've told her many times how grateful I am for this and the time that she spent with me when I just didn't get stuff because I was so late to the game. But the thing is, here we are talking about how a transgender person is going to spoil women's athletics. And the thing that frustrates me is most of these men, and it is men talking about this, most of these men, they didn't give a shit about it, women's basketball or women's sport five seconds ago. They've never once thought about Title IX and how women deserve to have some kind of recognition for the effort. They all work just as hard to end up in a situation where they get remunerated like somebody who works at Hardee's. This is... Where were these people? Where was their indignation for all of these many years when women have been left without for the same effort to put in? And now, now when they think it's a culture war issue, now they want to get exercised, excited and exercised about this one athlete. No, I won't give them that. As if you'd change genders to dominate pin swimming. Utterly ridiculous. And, and, you know, the thing is, we only ever see it this way, right? We only ever hear this conversation about transgender women. And, and the reason we only ever hear about transgender women is because men, um, we don't care about women. We just care about men. A and straight men believe that they have this right to know the origin story of every woman, no matter whether they're, to them it's a real woman or whether it's not to them. This ridiculous idea of real men fixate on transgender women because men think it is the most awful terrible thing that any man could do to remove this thing that makes us so powerful that's why they think it's disgusting it's the same reason the exact same reason why straight men find gay men distasteful outside of the kind of imbecilic yuck factor it's the fact that in the mind of many straight men, a gay man has decided to be less masculine, less of a man. A lesson I would happily disabuse people of. Can you help me navigate the complicated subject matter of the Olympics and China and business relationships and everyone being compromised? I think of you as somebody not just fundamentally decent who uh, studies the human mind and is interested in really leading us to a better and more decent place. But on bare minimum terms, we can all sort of agree that human rights matter. I thought that was something we could all agree on and here we are going to China and we're going to have a sports spectacle where the athletes are not they're being discouraged from speaking freely we're a tennis player we still don't know if she's okay a famous Chinese tennis player who was sexually abused and as all our business relationships are compromised by the commerce that runs between here and China please give me something that is smarter than I'm hearing anywhere else on this subject matter because everyone's bought and compromised here that, no, uh, listen, I, I, I don't know that I am any less compromised. I, I, I know that we as an organization, APS Intelligence as an organization, works with uh, Chinese companies that would be under the same duress as all others to, to stick to the party line, literally. Um, I, I, I think it's important that we say this first. I, and I didn't, all, I didn't used to know this. Um, 
It is really important that we disambiguate, that we separate the people of a country from the government of a country. It's, it's hard for us to do sometimes, but sometimes we imagine, we say China is bad because of what it's doing to the Uyghurs, and all of China is not bad for what is happening with the Uyghurs. The government of the officials of the power sources of China is certainly, uh, if not responsible, complicit. And so it's important that we don't end up in this situation where broadly Asian people find themselves targeted because of the bad acts of a government, because um, then British people and Americans alike would be in a hard-pressed place. The world is too interconnected, and we have relied <clears throat> on an economy that makes stuff cheaper so that everybody, no matter their status, can buy stuff. And until that, ref until that framework shifts, until people say, I will not mind the fact that I can't um, grab hold of Amazon, my app and order something and have it arrive tomorrow, then we're all complicit. I am complicit as, in what happened to the Uyghurs, but because of the connections that I have, the companies that I'm, I use, whether I'm uh, top of head on, on them or not. When it comes to sports, I think there is something different here. There's an additional layer, which is that, I, I mean, Amazon, as much as it claims to be a warm and fuzzy company, I think anybody who forces their people to live in cars while wearing um, nappies at work is, is probably pretty compromised. But sport claims that human rights uh, are, are, are unassailable. Sport claims that sport is a human right. Sport claims that it's a vehicle for change. And yet, the second it meets the mildest resistance, it, it falls over. Sport claims that it cares about human dignity, and yet when it comes to football, for example, uh, British soccer as opposed to, um, we've got a World Cup that's going to a country where three, well, more than 3,000 people have died. 3,000 mostly immigrants have died in the making and the building of that, of that stadium. So whether you're talking about Uyghur in China, whether you're talking about the suppression of democratic rights in, in China or in Hong Kong, whether you're talking about what's happening in Qatar or America or the United Kingdom, we are all complicit because much like with climate change, we're not willing to do the things that would be required of us to force change. So should anyone be doing anything? I can't put this on the athletes, but oftentimes athletes do rise up in these situations. They do. I'm not necessarily sure that rising up in China is a good idea. I think boycotting is, is one of the things that's always available, but people have to realize the consequences are dire, especially for the Olympic athletes who are generally not paid as much unless they are also in one of the recognized sports leagues. This is not an issue of, you know, are we not tired of being under the illusion that one charismatic figure will change the world? No, I suppose we're not tired of that because it's nicer to believe that if LeBron James said some words about China, that would change because then it, it obviates us of the responsibility to do anything ourselves, to stop buying stuff made in Chinese factories to stop buying the stuff that is made in prisons in America to make it so cheap. Of all the things that you've seen over the pandemic, John, selfishness, billionaire wealth, making the income disparities across the world even more appalling than they already were. What are the things fast forward over the pandemic where you're like, God almighty, can we just slow some of this down? Some of this so that I can stop being dispirited and exhausted every day. Um, I, I um, <clears throat> this is so this is what I saw over the pandemic. Because right? I, I, I retired from the NHS in December. I didn't get, didn't get a chance to talk to you, but yeah, I left after 10 years. I, I retired. I'll probably rejoin when things are a little less busy, but I'm retired from the NHS for now. But I spent the last two years in the NHS, uh, National Health Service in Britain. And, and <clears throat> during the height of the pandemic, I, I, as a board member, was sending two condolence letters a week 
to my colleagues. I have 31,000 colleagues. Uh, and I was sending two condolence letters a week to the families of people who died. And <clears throat> as, as woke as I am, I, I thought of the doctors and I thought of the nurses. And then suddenly I realized that it was the, it was the porters and it was the cleaning staff whose young children were being deprived fathers and mothers. And so through the pandemic, what I realized is that we have to give a damn about each other. That's it. How many calls have some of your listeners been on with their junior colleagues where they've watched them in their most intimate space, hot laptop on their knee while they're perched on the edge of a bed with their roommates walking behind them? We've seen our people and our colleagues as people. And now we have an opportunity to say we actually give a damn about them and live up to that. And not just about paying people more, but giving people a better experience. And that's what I think we can focus on. I don't think that, that people are uh, paying enough attention, John, to the way or how things have to be systemically for minorities to be disproportionately impacted by everything that's happened over the pandemic for a number of different reasons uh, and not because they deserve it. Like when you see the numbers, you see that some people just can't afford to get vaccinated because they need to keep going to the meatpacking plant because America will not do meat scarcity. And we, you know, we keep basically throwing human beings into the mall and more often than not, they're black or brown. There is always going to be that, well, at this moment, there's there's always going to be that discrepancy across society where black and brown people are disproportionately uh, impacted whenever there is something that will harm society that comes along, whether it's a pandemic or whether it's a financial crash. Women are always going to be more harmed by societal ills. Immigrants always going to be more harmed by societal ills. This is the... This is the system we've set up, and it's, but it's not a very difficult understanding, right? This is because there's a hierarchy of, of dignity in this world. And being a man is higher than being a woman. Being straight is higher than being gay or queer. Being, <clears throat> being white is higher than everything else. And when you start getting combinations of these things that are lower, when you're a, a Latina woman, who's queer, all of a sudden these people sink so low that the, the, the blades of disruption, um, they mulch them first. But we like this system because those of us who know we're not closest to the blades realize that we have time that is given to us by the very presence of this cannon fodder. We're all complicit in this. Every time I walk past a, a rough sleeper, I know I'm part of this. I pay my taxes. But I'm part of the system that allows for a human being to end up sleeping at a bus stop. We all are. It doesn't make us terrible people, but <clears throat> sometimes it's just easier to look away and not realize that maybe now through a pandemic that has killed so many, where so many of the people listening here have been anxious and worried and fearful and mourning, maybe now is the time that we stop pretending that the package that people come in, this that we can see so obviously, should define the amount of dignity that we offer each other. You mentioned the phrase rough sleeper. And I don't know if you've always used that phrase. You mentioned woke a second ago. I want to talk to you about that, too, before we get to the fun stuff and stump the meech. But uh, I have had to change some of the language around this. Homeless, hobo, bum. Some of the things that I used to say when I was a kid uh, is now unhoused. And I have not heard rough sleeper before. But when did that become something that was part of your lexicon? I actually have no idea. Um, I just, I just know that any time we use the passive tense, you know, we, we talk about people being homeless <laughs> in the same way we talk about, um, violence against women, for example, 
we remove the agency of what's actually happening. No, no, no. What's actually happening is men are abusing women. Men are raping women. That is what's happening. So let's not take away the, the, the causal agent. And I just know that, you know, people, when you talk about homelessness, it's as if they've just forgotten. <laughs> I, I've, I've lost my house. I don't know where it is. I have one. I could go to it, but it's my fault. I'm too drunk or I don't speak the right language or something else. But it's not that. You know, I, my um, my sister worked at a, a shelter. Now, this is this is decades ago, decades ago when when I realized she was a better person than me. And she took me there one Saturday morning very early. And I met this man, very thick German accent. And he was talking to my sister and I was looking at him and I had a very, I was, you know, maybe a bit saviorish in my approach. I had a very good idea about why people end up like this. It's because they don't really work hard. They've not tried to fit in, right? And he talked to my sister and then my sister made me go and talk to him. I didn't want to. And suddenly I realized this life in front of me. This man was a physicist. His wife had died and he had felt such despair that for a period of time he couldn't function. And before you knew it, some house payments had slipped. The house had gone, the car, car payments had slipped, the, the car had gone. And there he is with a, with a suitcase and a mind a little fractured, seeking solace in the bottom of a bottle by a bus stop. And you suddenly realize this isn't about individual people who are pointless in society or, or worthless. It's about a system that so arbitrarily assigns value to human beings. How do you feel about being dismissed as woke these days? Because you have lived a lot of this, John. Big, gay, black man in sports, uh, British accent, trying to fit in as confident and smart as a person as I've ever met, and yet the world too cruel to be trusted with the vulnerability of I'm going to tell you that I'm gay. You deserve, some for some reason, to know my sexuality. Uh, when I dismiss you with too woke as just fighting for this before it was trendy, wanting this for others because you wanted it for yourself because your mother taught you that she did not live a fun life, but she led a full life because she was able to help others and just be fundamentally decent. For you, when you get dismissed as woke now, as this is all weaponized and an army of people are fighting you every day more than you've ever seen before, right? You've been hated for a long time. You have big, mm -hmm. big, big gay black man who thinks he knows more than everyone else because he usually does, and has you keep the, that you're going to find me a date, and, um, and has <clears> the <throat> ego to show it too, and has the ego oh. believes he's smarter than everyone in every room that he walks into, Not and everyone. is constantly, constantly disproven by a physicist who makes him learn and humbles him. Exactly, that's the thing. I mean, being smart is about being open to learning new things. That, that's all it takes to be smart. To realize that you don't know everything is is all it takes. Um, woke, yes, woke is a device used by ignorant people in order to shut others up. It's a it's a mechanism uh, to make you feel guilty about caring. Woke in your dictionary is that Merriam Webster um, is well informed and up to date. The second definition underneath it is alert to injustice in society, especially racism. And, and all I know is that when somebody uses that as if it was a pejorative, I know that they are trying to silence me. If anybody uses it against me, like political correctness, they can use those words around me. I simply know who they are. They have identified themselves to me and they have ensured that I'm going to be more vociferous and louder, more accurate, cleverer because I know what they want is my apathy and I shall not give it to them. They want my silence and they shall not have it. Even though you gave it to them right there within 
awkward silence that allows me to sell his book right now as we we transition into Stump the Mage. It is The Promises of Giants. This man, if you like what it is that he does or has to say, I tell you, he is as eloquent as anyone I've ever met. uh, He'd love to write. I I don't even understand this part of you because you're a very busy man, but there was something about writing that spoke to you, and it's very difficult, but you do a very good job of conveying complicated thoughts. And this book is necessary right now. I don't mean to sell it or shill it so overtly, but you wrote this book essentially because you see an absence of leadership everywhere. And you're just asking everybody, please lead a little bit. Please, yes. people, just you lead a little bit. You can do something. I promise you. Just a touch. Just a touch. Blah, 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 blah. You guys done fixing the world already? You're yep. Ready? You ready to get your ass kicked, Meech? Legit good work here. Yes. Um, What's what's interesting is the the joy that you take in this. It used to be, uh, I I, I feel like I I might be turning a corner here. Therapy might be working. The joy that you take in my absolute destruction in and of itself makes me happy. Because I know at the end of this, even if I fail, you will be overjoyed. And I've done that for you. You're welcome. You want to know what happened, John? For You're all welcome. Your, for, for all Michael, your, Michael. Thank you. Michael. For all your brilliance, welcome. for all your brilliance, you showed your true colors the one time you got lucky in this game. And if you give someone success, they'll show you their true colors, and I did not. It's been like three it. times. <laughs> Who we? You won. Uh, this is how I remember it. He's now made it. It used to be two he was arguing for, and now he's made it I three. I won three times. What I recall is, this is all I recall, and honest to God, I'm not trying to doctor the record book. I recall that during the pandemic, ESPN wouldn't send us a goddamn microphone. We were broken as a show, and Mike needed to find some sounds because we had no content. I think we were talking about Tiger King for for about four straight days. Yeah, remember that? I believe we shouldn't have done that. That's a terrible yeah, mistake. Doc Antel, Doc Antel is not only someone who is a terrible person, I know this now, who uh, did terrible things to women, but also might be a murderer. That's We did not know that at the time. We were starved According for content. According to others, don't put that on him. We don't know. According to a documentary about his life in three parts on Netflix, but you beat us because we were broken. Hey, we report, you decide. We were broken during the pandemic. Broken. <laughs> and and you beat us because we couldn't find enough sounds because our library wasn't even working. Right. Big asterisk. Dan, Dan, Michael, you're welcome. I don't know what you're trying to do, but it's working. All right. <laughs> All right let's do this. Five. But, but I'm still going to kick your ass. And it's a supersized version of something meets. We're going with seven clips here. Oh, good God. All right. How about how confident are you? Jesus, seven clips. Are you confident enough, Mike, that if you think this is going to be an ass kick- kicking, are you willing to declare him a winner if he gets three because of Ooh, the degree? No, three is of- too much. But I was, because I'm so confident, I was going to say if you merely get two of these seven right, I would deem you a push. If you get three, you win the game. So you are willing to do that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, he was so kind with that thank you thing. It was weird. All right. Are you ready? Yeah. Yes. He he really manipulated you. You're well, welcome. Hypnotized into doing something. I know. Are you ready now? I've to change the math. Usually the first one is easy. It's the easiest one. Usually if one. you get more wrong, what what is happening? What is the first sound for John Amici on a Stugatz mispronunciation? Opportunity. Opportunity. So I want to say opportunity. Opportunity. Do you opportunity. Want, do you want to say it or are you saying it? There's a tootie in there. Opportunity. Uh, do you want to say it or are you saying it? No, I'll, I'll it, go with opportunity. Okay, because it sounds like he tripped over the second P. Opportunity. And, and the second P made him hit his chin on a speed bump of, of, made of cement. Uh, but I also think it's opportunity. Opportunity. Is that your final answer? Yes, that was his yes. final answer. Oh my God! A strong start by Amici. Oh wow! There are six more, and Chris Cody's I laughing back there. Start. Okay, so that's all you're gonna get. <laughs> <laughs> okay, taunted from another side of the room. Did you did you collect this batch? I enjoy this game. Uh, let's get the second it's one. It's almost as if every game has a running theme. <laughs> almost. Here's your second option. It, it. 
<laughs> it, it, it is a cat. It's a rat. It's a ribbit. It's a frog. It, 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 it's to as it, a frog. It, 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 this is my haunted it, it, nightmares it, it, outside my window when I'm sleeping at night. It, 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 a frog it, 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 with Stugatz's face on it. It's like is Jaws. It? It's getting closer. Um, I, I don't know. Is it? Is it? Is it? Yes. Is. Just is. Is. Uh, I feel quite good about that. I feel quite good about that. Okay, I was I was in the ballpark. Yeah. Not far away. <laughs> the third one for it. I order it. I order it. It sounds like something he'd shout at you by going uh, past you on a merry-go-round that's out of control. I order it. It's got the Doppler effect built in. I order it. I order it. I order it. It sounds like Ireland, but I can't imagine any context where he'd need to say that. This is two words. Ah. Uh, oh, I order it. A clue. I order it. I order it. My initial guess was Iowa. I order it. I, I don't know this one. I don't know. Oh, wow. Just a quit. So he quits. It is him saying, I order. I order it. Not, oh, not no, too hard. No, I would never, there's not a chance I would have got that. Okay. But no, I, now I hear it, though, at least. At least I usually I can't even hear him anywhere in these. Because, I order it. Yeah, that, I can you see can how he would make now. ordered seven syllables. I order it. All right, here's your next one. That. <laughs> that. 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 Don't. A good guess. Oh, wow. That was a good guess. Didn't. Didn't. Oh, that, 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 oh, oh that, you were oh, right goodness. there. You were so close. So close. This is your so this game of inches. Uh, Owie. <laughs> Owie. <laughs> it's uh, his last words Owie. Uh, while being stabbed to death. Owie. <laughs> Is it one word or two? One word. I think I might hear this. Sounds like Maui to me or Cali. I can't tell. I was going to go Alley. Without. <laughs> okay. Owie. That, is, that is quality work. That's right? not possible. That's offensive. That's, That's not offensive. Uh, How many do we have left? You have two more. Oh, it's possible to win then. Good. Yeah, it is possible. You've gotten one, and two's a push. You can push. Yeah, you can push. You can still win this, and you have that winner's mentality. You're welcome. I do. I do. <laughs> Is that one word or two? One word. <laughs> it's an iguana sneezing. <laughs> Touch. Final answer? Yeah. Top. I've noticed you're a lot quicker with the I got it wrong sound than you were with the I got it right sound. Well, I'd never assume that you're going to get one right, so I have to look for it for uh, a little bit. It's an adjustment. Okay. Top. So this is for a push. This that is, was top, by the this way. This is top. just <laughs> for you not to leave a loser. You're going to be a loser here. The best you can do is not lose here. I get can't leave a loser because I know the joy in Michael's heart when I go away. It's fine. 
For shop. For shop. Is this for two shop. words? This is one word. Uh, for uh, shop. You thought it was for sure as well? For shop. 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 Hold oh, on a second. That's a bit relentless. Hold on. So it's hard to know which one of the two sounds I'm supposed to focus on here. For shop. For shop. Tell you what, I'm I mean, probably playing like it too Dan much. It sounds like Dan Aykroyd saying for sure. Mm. With for a shop. broadly it does. Bostonian accent. For shop. <laughs> It does. It is. It is. Dan Aykroyd That's actually in correct. training yeah, it is. It is. It is. Dan Aykroyd saying. <laughs> no, you I'm, got it exactly right. Yeah, that exactly was a, we right. threw in a trick. <laughs> You're so good at this game. We threw in a trick and you got it exactly right. It was Dan, Dan Aykroyd saying for sure in trading places. For sure. All right. Give give me a guess. Um. One more time. For sure. You said it's one word, so I don't know. First, it sounds like first off. It's Versace. Wow. First off, you know what the problem is, and this is this is my fault. Um, there is no universe where I could have conceived as Stu got saying Versace. <laughs> I I love the idea. I can give you a Moneyball one right now. A money uh, ball? Yes. To win the yes. whole thing. Yeah. To win the yes. whole thing. Yeah. The juxtaposition. <laughs> the juxtaposition. Is the, the juxtaposition, that's just one word, right? <laughs> yes, one word. The juxtaposition. Well, juxtaposition. That's got to be juxtaposition. <laughs> yes, he hits yeah. the money ball. Yeah. Yes, we didn't want you to leave a loser. We wanted to give you some decency, even though next time you're going to claim you won four times because you have not well, won four no, times. That was the money ball. You win if you hit the money ball. Yes, there you go. All right, how about this? Try to tell me what Chris Mad Dog Russo is trying to say. Uh, but is a Farah, is a Farah, Farah, how you pronounce it? Farah, Farah is a Farah now. <laughs> <laughs> what is Chris this is Mad so Dog good. Russo this is trying so good to say right here? here. This is uh, but is a Farah, is a Farah, Farah, how you pronounce it? Farah, Farah is a Farah now. <laughs> what this is the reverse? Is Chris Mad Dog Russo. <laughs> Trying to say um, here. Uh, but is a Farah, is a Parah, Farah, how you pronounce it? Parah, Farah is a Farah now. <laughs> That's unbelievable. You know what? I, I'm frustrated with this because I've actually seen this clip. And I can't remember what it was he was supposed to be saying, but I know it's nothing like what he actually said. Uh, but is a Farah, is a Parah, Farah, how you pronounce it? Para Farah is a Farah now, as far as the world of sports is concerned, outside of that little area in the Bay Area where the Giants continue to honor him to this day. Hafariah. And so the Giants oh, continue to honor yeah. him. To <laughs> oh, my God. I had heard that clip before. <laughs> you had the test results. Well, then you definitely lose the money ball. We have to take it back. No, 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 no. no, no. We're not going back you in lose. time. Lose. You I'll lose. tell you what, though. I'll tell you what. I'll lose the money ball as long as you feel great about it. I feel fantastic. Yes, I got what I I'll want. I'll take Remember, it. I'll take hey, the L. Hey, I'll hey, take the L. You want to? You want to think back to that first one? That you, you got the first you one. Got, you, got, you got so excited. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, this is an easy game opportunity. What do you got next? This never accelerates. <laughs> I, uh, I I won the money ball. I gave it away to enhance your happiness. This has been a good day. It's been a good day. See you later, Amici. Thank you for allowing us to waste your important time. Take care. But what nipples did you put on Stugatz at one point? Meat nipples. <laughs> Meat nipples. It was yeah. weird. Yeah. I'm still really for yeah. like pepperoni. I'm yeah. glad I wasn't the only one who thought that was weird. The, the reason I called them meat nipples is because I thought I heard a phrase like that on the Righteous Gemstones. And I, I thought, but I might have gotten it wrong. It might have been some other phrase like that. I'm on it. So what I thought I thought I was. Well, we all experienced it the same way. I mean. <laughs> that means you're grabbing them from up here. Oh, I just I thought it's a like, funny phrase that would make everybody do that. Right. No, I get it. I'm just simply doing, forgive me, because I've been saying. The next bet, like those people that get like hung up in the air by their back meat. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, God. In like meat lockers? <laughs> yeah. Oh.
Oh, why did you just do that? Why? Why did you just do that to us? I'm all in. You said meat nipples. I, I know, and you've been startled by it, but please help me because across a decade on ESPN, I was the only one saying nipples. Put it on the poll at Lebitard awesome. Show, We're Guillermo. Doing show now. Awesome. Across <laughs> across ESPN in ten years was Dan the only one saying nipple because it feels Real dirty and people people yeah, yeah, I know. That's, really. Thank you. Put that on the resume. Stugatz, I want, okay, so that's the poll where I want the respect of the masses. <laughs> Real tra- I'm bragging. You think I'm bragging about that? <laughs> it sounded just, like you just are. Just to be clear, okay. <laughs> the only one in ten years <laughs> who said nipples. Yes, the so re- proud. And and meat nipples. Is is something that I just said that you all reacted to, and I don't. I want to break through America's discomfort with the word nipples. I want to break through. I've been trying for ten years unsuccessfully. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a part of your body. It's just there, and so now I threw in a meat nipples, and now you're totally disoriented. Mm-hmm. You think I'm doing sensual talk? Well, I think the nipple is fine. Like we're we're okay saying it. It's the meat. Them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the meat nipple. Breathe the nipple. <laughs> I kind of thing. I kind of. I kind of want Dan's top five words that make us uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I, oh, Moist. No. Number five. Race. I was just gonna say that. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna make that number one. <laughs> one through uh, five. I was gonna yeah. go two black, one race. I was gonna do a whole thing Four. for you. China. <laughs> I would like the words that make professional broadcaster witty uncomfortable. <laughs> Moist is a good one. I don't Roy. think he would say nipples. You know what though? I feel like we need. <laughs> To normalize so saying the scientific terms for organs on the air. Well, like penis. if someone, yes. You know what? If someone takes a foul ball to the penis, we should just say he took a foul ball to the penis. Say mm-hmm. it. Because, say it. yeah, you know what? Next time I will. Next, Next time it game, happens yeah. that, you know, like there's usually a, there's a wall for free kicks. Sometimes someone gets hit in the gonads when they're in the wall. Mm-hmm. I'm going to say. Test he got, this. I y- want yes. you to say test the boundary. This, yeah. I want naughty. Ruin your career. More. Ruin your career. Say penis more. But it's not ruining my say career. Do it. Do it. Do it. Yeah. If I said. No one else is chanting. If I said. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to chant say penis more. <laughs> If I said he got slammed in the dick, that'd be one thing. Yeah, it'd be one but if thing. I said Uncle Dick. he took it. <laughs> he's doing this thing as an old person. Chris, he's doing this thing as an old person. Yeah, no. Kornheiser. No, this happened to Kornheiser. It's happened for 15 years to Kornheiser on television. You say a word, and he will just, the immediate word association of he thought of his brother Dick. Right. Yeah. And he's just going to say it, and it's only funny to him. He got a hole in one recently, Dan. He did. He did. Thank you. Yeah. He Why really are you did. taking applause for your brother's <laughs> skidded hole in one? That's, That's a big my deal. kid, man. Yeah. That's my kid. Yeah. Exactly. You're proud of your brother's yeah. Dan, right You're proud of your brother's art and the yeah. fact that there's yeah. cruisers with his art. Same thing yep. with the hole in one. That's right. Mm-hmm. That Our... ship has been out there for 10 days on that ocean. My brother's ship. Reminding me every day of why do we not have anywhere to put our ships? Tallywhacker. You could say tallywhacker, Woody. (laughs) No, just the the scientific term. Got hit in the testicles. What else are you longing to say besides penis on air? It's not. It's not longing. I'm just saying that like every. (laughs) No, it's every announcer comes up with. Oh, it took one downstairs. Ah, I I like that though. I I mean, it's clever, but it's also like (laughs) it it leads to. Confusion. No, not confusion. It leads to us not being willing to say these words. They're very normal. They're just anatomically correct. Be willing to say penis. Yeah. Be willing to say penis. I'm with Whittingham on this. And I love the rebellion, the art of Whittingham being the one to test this particular boundary because I regard him as genderless. We've said this before. I'm right. I think of him Whoa. as having. That's weird. He's got, yeah. Whitty's got doll parts. We've already what? covered all of this. Do you, do oh, you really? Think of all of our parts? His entire body is just whatever it is that a doll is when you would buy a doll. This is what I would imagine. I love him <laughs> testing to me. this. <laughs> what do you think my parts look like? <laughs> I don't have to think there, big boy. <laughs> I mean, this obviously is going to end with Angel having a picture yeah. of Witty's face on his shirt that says, say penis more. But I am I am with Witty on this. He's just saying. Who's his Ken doll body? Scientifically. I am saying that Witty wants us to scientifically use the terms and get more comfortable and stop being so repressed. 
And I love that him, 28-year-old, is going to be the one viewed as naughty and create instigate a national controversy if several guys get hit in the penis. Yeah. Where you're saying penis again and again, and people are going to get complaints to the FCC. You got to switch it up, though. You got to throw in a scrotum every once in a while. That's right. Yeah. 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 Kicked in the scrotum. Right. Right in the scrotum. Why not? Uh, again, anatomically correct. Yeah. If you looked up... <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> if you looked up an anatomy textbook, you would see the word scrotum. That's right. You would see yeah. the word testicles. That's right. You would see the word penis. I think you should test all of this. I'm hoping for an outbreak. I'm hoping for just a, 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 a spree a of injuries. Outbreak? A spree of injuries. An outbreak of penis guy, hits. Yeah. Where a guy gets hit seven times in the scrotum. Yep. <laughs> but the word, wait, but the wordplay is so fun with the midsection. I like a good twig and berries. Ooh, red and like, red we're red giving up a lot of I love fun a good stuff. Johnson. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Shaft. I love Johnson. a good Johnson. Yeah. 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 Webster's honored ball sack. Uh, by including it as a word. Wow, congrats. Uh, about five or six years One ago. One word? No, I believe they put a hyphen there. I'm not positive. Well, wait a minute. Put it on the poll, please, Guillermo. Does ball sack have a hyphen? Could I, go either way. Or is it one word? Or is it two words? It's a talent to not go scientific. It's a talent to entertain those yeah. by uh, by avoiding saying those words. Foul tip, hey, how's your uncle? Like, that's yeah. funny. I don't hear a lot of Johnson. Have you heard a lot of broadcasts? I'm not I hearing nearly enough. I think that's <laughs> just in Austin Powers. I think that's aggressive. Uh, Stugatz just shouted, echoing, I love a good Johnson. I and do. I don't think that that's something that any self respecting <laughs> announcer would say. It's as bad. I mean, it's worse than penis, I think. It's more dangerous to say he just got. <laughs> he the just, Johnson. I mean, imagine Joe Buck. <laughs> Yeah, he just got he, he just got hit in the jo he just got hit in the Johnson. That's more dangerous than saying penis. Penis is just scientifically correct. So uh, like Johnson, Nick Johnson, Johnson is slow, but penis? I mean that's like slang for okay, keep going then though. Dong hog. Ooh, ho oh. How do you feel about hog? Woody? Oh, Foul tip hog. right in the hog. Yeah. Woody, what are the words that make you uncomfortable? This has just gone into you wanting to say penis more. Yeah. <laughs> um. I mean, that's really it, frankly, in terms of things that could actually happen in context of a sporting event. You're, you're, you're not really using much else. There'd be no reason to use an anus, right? No. Well, I, no. That'd actually, be a difficult you know foul tip. You know what? Yeah. I don't say Take butt. Anus. I don't say butt. I Why usually not? say bum or backside. Why? Backside. So I'm going to start using butt that's now. Yeah. If, you you, if someone gets hit in the butt, hmm. you know, you a free kick and it comes off his butt, I'm going to say wow. hit him in the butt. No, you won't. No, keister believe, and the keister. I don't, I don't believe How about the either. tushy? Keister and tushy. Gluteus Maximus. Ah, the glutes. <laughs> That's oh, that free kick hit him right in the cock a doodle doo. <laughs> Greg gets it. Like, Thank he gets you. it. <laughs> cock a doodle doo. That's right. <laughs> you got to have fun with it if you're witty. You they know, because like sports can be so serious. Don't be so serious. What's that famous movie line? Why so serious? The Dark That's Knight? the line. Something like that. Yeah. That's the line. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you nailed it. Yeah. Thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Witty, is there any chance? Do you think, like, you crushed it right there? You just said thank you again. You think, I think we might have lost him with Uncle Dick. Like you got to get. <laughs> I did crescendo at Uncle Dick. It's been all downhill since then. <laughs> but you could have fun with Cockadoodle Doo. You could make it sing song, cock a doodle doo, that kind of thing. Yeah, he's right. You want to play it out? You want to? Can you give us some play-by-play -play right now of what you're imagining during a witty game? Can you be the announcer? We are thinking on Sunday of having a watch party during one of these NFL games that we've invited you to. You're gonna cook. You complained about cooking for us. We wanted to try your pea soup. Wanted to get some beers in you, mm. and we can't do play-by-play -play during the game, but I'd like to hear what it would sound like if, during a soccer match, Greg Cody wants Chris Whittingham to say what? Create the scenario that ends with your punchline. <laughs> he bent it like Beckham right into the cock a doodle do. So it doesn't really work. Right. Yeah. Because he tried to bend it like Beckham into the upper corner. Right. But he hit it too low into the wall, 
right into the cockadoodle doo. <laughs> you don't know a name of a of a single player that you could have mentioned there. Oh, that, you know, I'm I'm leaving it generic so that all the players out there listening can can imagine it was them right. that I'm referring to. Nice that was said you. with yeah. far too much joy for it to be a free kick into the wall. How would you do it? Yeah, how would you do it? Okay, now here we are. This is so unfair. Come on, professional. No, but you're giving yeah. this. Allegedly. Okay, Whittingham, this guy. Whittingham, allow me to set this up for a second. Because Whittingham listens to the game, I believe, differently than most of us. This is true of broadcasters who are really good oh, at, the, at the craft. Yeah, like an asshole. At the skill. Right. Oh, and judging. Ready. Yeah, judging. And so yesterday, Stugat started to try and start a podcast around it immedi- immediately, which is <laughs> witty talking about Kevin Harlan, like breaking down. The art of broadcasting. The, the sculpting yes. that He's Kevin. unbelievable at oh, football Lord. on the radio. He's yeah. the best. Yeah. As good as it gets. At football on the radio, Kevin Harlan on Westwood One. Boring. He'll do one of the championship games this weekend. He'll what? do the Super Bowl. Yeah. I cannot wow. recommend oh listening to a game. The sonic pleasure of that listening is- to Kevin Harlan do a game on the radio. Yeah, no, recommend people watching what Dan just said we're doing. Not yeah, that's true. Hopefully, Kevin he's doing Harlan. the AFC championship game. <laughs> yeah, just say cockadoodle do already. Okay. Yes, yeah, there's the art of broadcasting. Jeez. <laughs> I have filibustered enough. <laughs> you are now, the, the pressure is on Winningham to deliver someone else's joke because Cody just tried to do it and you saw it doesn't work. The joke doesn't work. <laughs> so now the pressure, expectation of funny is all on Winningham to create the goal call that ends again just so that he can sell and you can see what broadcasting talent sounds like so he can sell your, what you did so poorly when sure. I asked you to add right. lip. Well, I teed him up. Didn't want to overshadow him. Do you want, Whittingham, do you want your own play or do you want uh, Greg Cody's idea of what the play should be? You set the bar so low that he has to exceed it. Very Very nice teammate. Right. Well, the thing is, is that Greg called it as if it were an exciting moment in the game. If a free kick goes into the wall, then we're on to the next thing. So you kind of have to say it matter of factly. So it'd be something like, Nicolas Lodeto standing over a free kick. Seattle Sounders leading by a goal to nil. It's 25 yards away from goal, four men in the wall for Inter-Miami. And he'll step up now to the free kick. He approaches it, smacks it with his left foot right into the cockadoodle doo to carry him out to Jordan Morris on the right-hand side, cross-swung into the penalty area. It's headed over the bar to be a goal kick to Inter-Miami. Uh, so just that matter, in there, man. matter of fact. Matter of fact. <laughs> no, mm. he's more no. I like the singing, yeah. yeah. Big big <laughs> problem with that. You didn't identify whose cockadoodle do it That's was. That's exactly oh, yeah, right. Yeah, it was a yeah. problem with both of your presentations, I would say. Har- <laughs> Harlan would be like, you know the cockadoodle do. <laughs> That's why he's the best. Right between <laughs> the eyes. And he's working the <laughs> NFC game, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> that is exactly right. Connects if, with a cockadoodle-doo. Yeah. Very necessary uh, detail there by Christopher. But if it's a free kick, it's going into the wall. Oh, it's not, and we're, we're on to the next it, thing. Uh, free, free kick, yeah. nubbler up the middle, it doesn't matter. No. Kevin Harlan's going to bring it. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> why is Tony Why is Tony throwing an echoing from the corner of the room? Hell yeah. Well, because on... he's right. I mean, Kevin Harlan, didn't he make like a cat running on the field yeah. seem interesting? Like, Harlan doesn't take a second uh-huh. off, man. That's that was right. incredible. Yeah. Who's better at the delivery of play-by-play, Kevin Harlan on the radio or right. Gus <laughs> Johnson on television? Harlan. Harlan. Harlan's the best going. Yeah. I don't understand why he doesn't have, like, the marquee spots. I understand it's Monday Night Football, but it's also radio. What are you talking about? I'm pretty good. It took him forever. What is that? What was that? That's my Gus Johnson. Who is that? Uh, It's terrible. It sounded like Dick Vitale. I thought it was Dick Vitale also. (laughs) I thought it was Vitale. It took uh, took Harlan forever to surpass Marv Albert. It took Marv Albert retiring for Harlan to become the number one on, on TNT. And Harlan's been the best basketball guy for, like, a decade, at least on Mike Green division. I don't think that Mike Ryan and Whittingham know just how much production snobbery they listen to all this stuff with because I'm telling you, they're not passively listening on the Manning cast or any of this other stuff when you are a pre... I like Harlan too, but I don't have an eye or an ear for the sculpting crispness of how broadcasters do what Vince Scully managed to do into his 90s or makes Boog Shambi one of the best. You know who's not very good at it, though? ESPN's not very good at having the ear that you need to know who are the real sculptor craftsmen on what it is that these guys do, like Boog Shambi. If you've got the hammer, you've got to use it. 
So good. Hell yeah. <laughs> Dan, can we hear your impersonation of that again? Yeah. I don't think that I uh, I don't think I could summon what it is that I did uh, the one time that I tried to do my <laughs> Kevin Harlan because I am not good at this part. Say cockadoodle do. Just say cockadoodle do or yes. say it the as way Harlan. Say it. Yeah. Say it with a flourish. Cockadoodle do. Cockadoodle do. Cockle. Okay. Yeah. Amateur. Fine. Do we want to? <laughs> <laughs> do we want to try it around the room? What is the fine for cockadoodle do? You can uh, you can try it out. Here's uh, Kevin Harlan talking about that one time a cat ran onto the field during yeah. Monday Night Football, courtesy of Westwood oh One. Third and four, looks into the nickel of San Francisco in the secondary. Hey, somebody has run out on the field. Some goofball in a hat and a red shirt. Now he takes off the shirt. He's running down the middle by the 50. He's at the 30. He's bare-chested and banging his chest. Now he runs the opposite way. He runs at the 50. Flawless he runs broadcasting. The, the guy is drunk, but there he goes. The 20, they're chasing him. They're not going to get him. Waving his arms, bare-chested. Somebody stop Look that out. man. Here comes the blue coat, Kevin. Oh, they got him. Here comes they're coming the blue from the coat. left. Oh, and they tackle him at the 40-yard line. <laughs> Look at the police. They've surrounded this man like he is... Like he's just robbed a bank. I tell you what, he got a whole lap in he before did, yes. they got him. I mean, that was that was pretty good. I expected him to go down much sooner. Yeah. I hope it was worth it, my friend, because you've got a night in the clink coming up. <laughs> clink! <laughs> wow, the slammer! The he never broke character. <laughs> He he's bare chested. He he's did. running at the thirty. Well, he like it that, it's flawless. The, he called it with the same emotion that you would call like a breakaway run. <laughs> All right, I got that one wrong. Here's him calling the cat, courtesy of Westwood One. Oh, there's a cat. A black cat is taking the field. A black cat is running from the twenty to the near side, the ten. From the 39 in Dallas, here's a short throw down the middle, caught by Ingram. Caught at the 35, went to the 30. Now the cat running the other way. And so is Ingram at the 30 to the 25, to the 24-yard line. It's a catch run of 15. Now the cat is stopped at the 50. So is it bad luck for the Giants? Is it bad luck know. for the Cowboys? I don't know, but they've stopped playing. The players with hands on hips are watching the cat run and zigzag all over the field. He's Black at the cat eight. doesn't know that it was last Thursday that was Halloween. Thursday oh, night right. football, yeah, not Monday night football. He's a little bit late. Now he's at the five. He's walking to the three. He's at the two. And the cat is in the CDW red zone. CDW, people who get it now, a policeman, a state trooper has come on the field, and the cat runs into the end zone. That is a touchdown. And the cat is elusive, kind of like Barkley and Elliott, but he didn't know where to go. Look, at they're trying to corner him, and they got him in the end zone. There are state troopers all around this cat, which now climbs up into the stands, and the fans are running for their line. Now it goes back on the field again, and it's running in the back of the end zone, and it runs up the tunnel. So good. But Whittingham and Mike Ryan both had the same reaction listening to that. I saw it on their faces when the color man, I don't know who it was, and I said color man, when he came in and Harlan wanted to tell him, hey, I'm doing a thing. Yeah. I'm doing play-by-play on both of these things at the same time. I'm showing off right now. Right, what I felt I'm, that. Yeah. What I am doing right now <laughs> stay out of my way. is for yeah, the, right. like, stay out of the way. I have to. I don't know who is his partner on these broadcasts. I think in that clip it was Kurt Warner. I'm not sure if he still does no, it, but that was Kurt Warner. Kurt Warner this weekend, Kurt Warner this weekend yeah. as well. Yeah. Ex-partner after that. <laughs> You guys are listening differently, though. I think the sports fan just wants someone they like, and if Romo tells them a few things that they like, they don't need the, – they get mad at Joe Buck, but the play-by-play -play man makes an awful lot of money, and I don't believe that anymore. You tell me if I'm wrong about this, Whittingham. What's been your experience? Is it a merit-based system on the sculptors of the craft, the play-by-play -play man, and what he has to do – so that Al Michaels and Mike Tirico and the people who do it at the highest end of this are discernibly to your ear, to the broadcaster's professional sculptor artist ear, this guy, those guys are as good at what they do as anybody. Because that's not how I listen to broadcasts. I think most media criticism, written or otherwise, of play-by-play -play people is misguided, I would say. Mm. It's based off of some things that they say. It's not about the quality of the work that they do. You would judge broadcasters on different terms than I, I think often you hear, oh, he was good in this moment, he was bad in this moment. Like, that's not, like, it's 
play in and play out how you're describing things, variety of language, identifying things quickly, making things clear to the audience. I, I during that clip, picked out four things. Oh, right. Near side, oh, specifically saying the 24-yard line, describing the players as having hands on hips, incorporating a sponsor into the middle of that. Like, that's what broadcasting is. It's language. It's specificity. And you listen to that, and you can picture what's happening. And you want to say penis in the middle of all of that. You want... That's correct. <laughs> uh, because, Mike, you and, you and Whittingham, help me with this, because I don't know if I'm speaking for everybody here, but I don't feel like I have the skill set to tell you, hey, the best in the world at this craft are these four guys. I like Harlan, and I enjoy listening to him, but I'm not listening that way where every I'm not listening for every word. There wasn't a hiccup in anything he said there. There wasn't a pause, a stammer, a stumble, nothing. It was just clean, red, a tat, tat He was machine gun firing as a broadcaster. I'm not going to stumble on anything here. You guys tell me what the top of the craft is right now. Do you know Stugatz? Do you know any more? Because we used to care about this stuff. I don't feel like you and I listen to that anymore that way. Well, I never listen. I've always got it on mute. I would say Ian Eagle. I would say Chris Collinsworth. I would throw Tony Romo into the mix. No, no, We're but play-by-play. Play, different... play, play by play. Just play-by-play, play, guys. I would say Ian Eagle and Kevin Harlan for me. In terms of the new ones, and Mike Breen. He's a guy that I love. I don't I don't really know. Are there any great new ones? I'd say Kevin Burkhart on Fox is tremendous. Him and Greg Olson make a great team. And we also should, should distinguish. Television and radio skills are very different. Like I, Kevin Harlan is good on television. He's best ever on radio. So where do like, you want to like, say penis? On TV or radio? <laughs> Both. But on radio, he's in charge of painting a picture, Correct. describing what's right. happening to an audience who can't see. Right. For me, television is the analyst medium because people can see what's happening. You're providing some details. You're trying to be there to help the audience with the rules, with story, and we're just kind of taking you through each play. But it's the analyst who will tell you something that you haven't heard before or couldn't see with your own eyes. Radio is all about the play-by-play -play guy. It's why, this might sound selfish, but I like doing, like, the skill and craft of doing radio more requires more of the play-by-play -play guy, so I love doing radio. Are the people at the top of the food chain on the biggest broadcasts, are they now considered the best in their field or just the most established and the uh the longevity like is al michaels still doing it as well as he ever did because that's one of the great jobs in all of broadcasting he does one game a week they give him a ton of money but it's a lot of work like he's got to know every player on the field he cannot make mistakes because he didn't know who picked up that fumble and that it is a lot of work but it's the best job in broadcasting don't don't do this to witty because you're setting him up to just tear well, okay, people mike, down saying no okay, they're not mike, good anymore no because i think mike and i think mike and witty would have different answers than the audience i th i know i don't know but i'm not listening like that who do you think greg when it in most pleasurable broadcasts when you sit down to listen wherever it is that john madden or romo connect with people does the play-by-play -play guy matter for your experience how much does nance matter on the broadcast with romo how good is nance i have no idea i can't Feels tell you big when nance is there but yeah, i don't, yeah, I don't yeah. know i'm yeah. not listening with my ear and saying holy shit jim nance is so good at painting a picture for me i'm not knocking jim nance but he doesn't have to you're watching the game i mean that's the big difference yeah i miss pat summerall i'll tell you that i like the guys who uh, uh witty tell me if this isn't true the guys who go Shekin and Shevin. Shekin and Shevin from the 17. You know that style of uh I don't know what you're This doing. is the thing my dad's done my whole life. Anytime he hears a broadcaster, he'll walk by and like imitate it in that voice. He yeah. thinks every single play-by-play -play person is just like, it's Shekin and Shevin. Like, no, no. Shekin and Shevin. <laughs> well, this is somebody who's Is this Jim Brockmeyer? Are you talking about Dick Greenberg or somebody? <laughs> I don't know. I don't have anybody in particular in mind when right. I say well, that. Well, but it's somebody with a lisp, right? It, or a speech no, no. impediment. It's the broadcasting voice. You don't go Shekin and Shevin. You go Shekin and Shevin. I don't know who that broadcaster is, right. except the there broadcaster. There had to be a broadcaster in your youth. In a cartoon. That, right, yeah, it could have been, yeah. yeah. Maybe it was Summerall. Maybe. No, drinking. Summerall was often. Was it Sean Connery? No, Summerall was. <laughs> yeah, that kind of thing. It was? Yeah, that kind of thing. Shocking and shepherd. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Wait, all right. Well, if we're Mike going to do this. Mike gets it. Yeah, no, Mike gets it. Connery is a, is Mike, a broadcaster. I know you. I know that your Sean Connery is very limited. I'm not promising the people anything. 
Okay. I know it's very limited, and I don't want to push you into a position yeah, where. You know, you know. No, hold, well, I'll just, I just need a little bit. I just need a little bit. But right, before right. we go to Sean Connery doing some play by play. I appreciate it, but I'll pass. Thank you. <laughs> Christopher's been in the lab working on Sean Connery, by the way. <laughs> Really? Yeah. Wow, I'd love no, to hear that, Chris. Yeah. What is what Completely are you doing? Optional. Why are you pu- I, I, Have you not been in the lab? I mean I see both sides. <laughs> there you go. Not not bad. Bad. Now say my punchline, I'm out. Yeah. Now say second and seven. Second and seven. <laughs> there you go. It's it like is heck. fun to do it at Greg is right. At, he's right about what? That Chris was in the lab. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you get it. You guys get it. I am putting Whittingham in a terrible spot. I am. And I'm putting Mike, who did put it on the poll, Guillermo? Who did Dan put in a worse spot? <laughs> Chris Whittingham or Mike Ryan? Because asking you to do play by play as Sean Connery is what the people want. You put Cody in a bad spot. <laughs> Seriously. I think the people want play by play by Sean Connery. <laughs> I wish I did a Connery. Not you, the people want. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Want to name that episode Shekin and Shevin? <laughs> Shekin and Shevin. <laughs> Sheffield for Shevin sets up a Shekin and Shevin teen at the Shevin yard line. <laughs> I don't know where I went with that. <laughs> Not one broadcast like that. I know. <laughs> It was like Eric Reed showed up for the like the last two seconds of that. This is all you're hearing is Eric Reed. You're you're mixing Eric Reed and Sean Connery. Well, the Shekin and Shevin is real. I mean, that's you've heard it a, somewhere. That's a thing that happens. Okay, they teach it in broadcasting school. That's a funny appendage to have on the on the end of that. Him nailing. <laughs> Stugatz, we got a surprise for you coming in a few minutes here. I think you're really going to enjoy. I'm not going to tell you anything else, just that as happy as I've seen you in the last year, uh, I believe that we are going to try to recreate something here with you that's going to move you a little bit shortly. But before we do that, Greg Cody of the Miami Herald has stunned me, stunned me, because he says he's got two back in my days. Wow. Not one. Wow. But two back in my days. Oof. And Chris, you told me, I'm not even sure. It seems like he's just written one on the fly very quickly because he was moved, inspired. This thing has gotten stale for him. He doesn't want to do it every week, forced every week. But something has moved him to write this morning. And I don't think, Chris, it's even the subjects that you think it is. So what subjects did you guys talk about this weekend as you tried to cajole your father into doing his job around here? If I'm being completely honest, we discussed these on Saturday night and I may have been into the Miller Lights. So I don't actually remember what the Ah. ideas were. I just remember that on Saturday night, we put two ideas into his notepad that were back in my day. But this is neither of those ideas, and it relates here to something that we've got going on that has escalated to a a place that's really uncomfortable for for a number of different reasons. (laughs) It's not just because Mike Ryan has, like, turned his negotiations into a giant public mess that actually involved this stupidity with his hair. I didn't do that. You guys did. Okay, but people are tired of it, and the company's tired of it. We're tired of the the fact that you have reneged on your bet in a way that has been public. I don't want to get into a dispute about the facts of this. It's disappointing, man. But the the audience is mad, and the company's mad, and everyone's mad. And you've been talking about a dossier that you've wanted to get to for (laughs) for, for five days. Uh, And you've been waving around. I love a good dossier. dossier. Yeah, Yeah. 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 then you're going to love this. (laughs) Yeah, the audience. Everyone's mad that I'm not shaving my head because I won a bet by a lot, mind you. I shouldn't be shaving my head. If someone shaves her head, it should be Sue Gatz, spirit of the deal. But how dare you and the audience come at me for trying to honor this bet when you guys have been egregious offenders of never paying up on your bets? A lot of people throwing stones from glass home. So here. Why are you looking at me on this? Oh, you're a big offender. And that's not just a fat joke. Okay, so <laughs> here's what I propose. Jeez. Even though I was right and I won my bet by I a I feel lot, like it was a fat joke. <laughs> That's all it was. I feel like it was. <laughs> Even though I won my bet by a lot, 
If I come to terms with Metal Arc Media, I am willing to shave my head, but I have a condition. And that is because I'm going to fight for the people. I'm going to give the people what they truly want, which is not me shaving my head. It's everybody else paying their debts. So let's begin with Stu Gatz. Okay. Stu Gatz, I will shave my head if you pay the charitable donation you promised the Florida Panthers back in 2007. Mm-hmm. <laughs> all right. Five yeah. goals. He he did a series of interviews they all over the place. Goals, uh, no, was it nine goals? And yeah. Stu got said, what is it, $500 a goal that he was going to give for? Yeah. I wasn't counting on nine. So no. it was like $4,500. You still haven't owe. paid. You mm. took all the glory. You did interviews on it. You never paid up. Right. Also, you owe PKs. You've been talking about it for close to eight years. Mm -hmm. You haven't done that. And on the grid of death, you owe a deaf poetry jam. Hold on, Mike, right. if I may, to the audience. Who's that in may... charge of making me do these things, by the way? Just out of curiosity. Well, that's what that, that's curious that you should say that because I'm saying the same thing. Who's in charge of making me do <laughs> Well, this is gonna be a metal block. It's gonna what's gonna happen here? Like we we're just developing like a human resources department. We've got a problem on our hands because this is what's gonna happen when you go into free agency and you do some of this stuff. You can't get anyone to get along and then it becomes part of contract negotiations. And everything else. But uh, well, by the way, I would like to thank the CEO of Sheets and Giggles, who made sure to send me this dossier. Great he guy. Is, he is leading the charge on well, this, this investigation. Great guy. And you cannot trust someone with your betting, your like how you sleep at oh, night, man, with this type of task. I don't know who you trust. Mm -hmm. Trust him with your betting. Yes. Trust us with your history, betting. His, yeah, no, history has shown that the people that are in charge of like pillows and betting are at the forefront of these things. Also, you need to dress up like a leopard. Okay. If I can just rewind for a second, for the people who don't know about the PKs, Stugatz claims he can make eight of ten kicks against a professional, yeah, an has, MLS. Did I say eight out of ten? Yeah, he has. He said it was easy. Right. So you have four things that you have to do. Okay. Dan, what was the fourth though? What? Why a le leprosy? Uh, okay, but, but what was, was the context? It was like uh, he has to dress up like a leopard. It's a leopard. See, oh. he so hasn't done that, and that is several years old. Dan, you owe a sausage race dating back to the Kimbo Slice, Matt Mitrione fight. This is what I feel like is unfair. <laughs> Kimbo it, Slice it, died Kimbo several Slice. years ago. It, no, he's right. He's right about this. Probably, probably can't so, do that. I, I feel like you'd forgotten about that one, and that I reminded you a week ago when we were talking about this and your damn dossier, and you were waving it around. And and I think I reminded you. I do owe Matt Mitrione a sausage race in Milwaukee. You also owe the audience a <laughs> Prince Fielder photo shoot. Did I lose? You did lose that bet. What I didn't like about this, and I uncovered, and this was actually the birth of the fine bomb bet the first time that Sue got paid up on the bet, and hopefully the first of two because he lost that bet. I won by a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, he gave you a way out entering a game seven. This was when the Cavs came back from down 3-1. It was Dan doing the naked photo shoot that Prince Fielder did versus the fine bomb. It was do or die game seven. Sue Gatz had a winning hand eventually, but he gave you just a way out, which was so cowardly. Nobody paid off to the audience. It was only until the following year that we made the very same bet, and Sugats actually paid up. Sugats, I begged, I pleaded with you to give me a buyout. You never listened. You did that once before. Why not this time? Very curious. Billy, you owe a sexy sax man. Have for several years. I bought all those things with my own money. Never got it. You also need to do the sting, in which you're shirtless, oiled up, slapping a bass. And you also have to dress up like Lou Bega in Mambo Number no. Five. Uh, Billy owes all of that. Yes, Chris Billy. Cody. But Billy wasn't a part of this Hello. bet. Not that was Cody. Chris. <laughs> that wasn't part of this. Right. We're doing what's owed. This I mean, company owes me sixteen hundred dollars in medical bills for the grid of death. So, Chris Cody, you have to marathon all the Fast and Furious movies since you actually hey, lost his. Someone grid actually death. did that for me. Another Stop. podcast did that for Billy, me. Billy, you got charged. <laughs> you, Billy, you got charged sixteen hundred. This is the first I'm hearing. Have you been carrying around these resentments all this time? This is the. Oh, I have a dossier of my own. We ended up oh, in the hospital. We, we all ended up have in the a hospital. dossier. But what's I mean, the sixteen hundred dollars? The Onion, the biting of the onion yeah, caused medical you. Medical bills. Yeah. Well, they, we should pay for that. I was actually asked by an ESPN executive if I expensed that, and I'm like, um, that's not how things work around here. But wait a minute, how did you, how did you not get paid for that? Like you were injured on the job. So Metal Arc, which doesn't have, we're sort of developing the human resources department, should pay for that. That should be paid for because Disney was supposed to pay for that. How could you get injured on the job? You guys laugh about this, you guys, but I, you guys thought that the pepper was bad. Oof.
Guys, I just walked into the kitchen, and I'm not kidding you, and this are, these are things I never had to think about before. Greg Cody's talking to Bob the engineer, and all he's talking about is like, man, I would love to workplace liability sue this place. Wow. <laughs> like, he's in a kitchen that we just yeah. built out there because we didn't have a kitchen. Greg gets it. Kitchen right. before, oh, and he's it, looking for a slip and fall. Is it because it, it, it of the big hole in the kitchen? we got to yeah. plug that hole. We were just talking yeah, to liability. Anthony. Yeah, about how long Bob thinks he's going to live for. Yeah, we, mm. we 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 settled on eighty five. Yeah. Tony thinks he's gonna get there. Wait, too. I said you I'm guys not decided there. how long Bob's? No, we asked Bob. Okay. We asked Bob yeah. How old is he now? Sixty five. Eighty three. I bet you he's thirty seven. <laughs> Chris, since you lost the bet to watch all the Fast and Furious <laughs> franchise movies in one sitting, there have been three other Fast and Furious movies. <laughs> you also have to sing "Take Me Out to the Ball," uh, "Take Me Out to the Ball Game" at a minor league ballpark, and you have to dump a bucket of chili over your head. The oh. chili one was a thing we disputed with uh, Sarah Spain. And I, I don't believe care I, that about one your was, new one. That one, that one, Greg that one I definitely did. Greg the other Cody. Two, You've done you. what? Greg Cody. I've sung Take Me Out to the Ball Game at a minor league ballpark. There, my dad did that for On you. Greg Cody Day in Fort Myers. Greg Cody. <laughs> yeah. You owe the Kentucky Derby, where you have a floral wreath uh, over your neck for an entire show. You owe the spaghetti gloves, yep. in which your hands should go into gloves that have spaghetti in also them. Also threw a perfect strike Also. That day. You need to have your hands in a finger trap Did for you? the entire show. This is elder abuse. Roy, I will give you credit. Roy, I will give you credit. You His also owe the Montero. That's right. Where is your uh, Lil Nas X photo shoot, my friend? He's a big fan of mine, Lil Nas X. Yeah, he okay. follows me on Twitter. Yeah. Oh, I, I'm, I did, I'm lining just, him up for my podcast, The Greg Cody Show. It's unbelievable. Guys, this I call is, him X. This is just from previous what? years. Hmm. Death December was a big disappointment. Very few payoffs. You guys owe a lot. Credit to Roy Bellamy and Dan Levitard when it comes to the grid of death. You guys have paid up. You guys are stand-up gentlemen. If I met, if I made that bet with you, I would have honored it. After we looked into it, this is a hell of a dossier, though he's put together, it's and a I good one. And, and I do believe there should be some negotiation so that the audience, not Mike Ryan, gets their payoffs on all of this mm -hmm. stuff. Like we need, including to, Mike Ryan. We need to. Yeah. Well, right. I will mostly. I have is. always put the audience before me, and I will absolutely do this despite winning this bet by a lot instead of you you should be the one doing it many are saying this yeah. but if we're gonna go around and lift the audience up and you have to do this for the audience no that's fair you're, you're selling them out and how can you go back on your word then let's shine a that's light fair. on your own atrocities i mean when it comes to the wagers made on this show i stand for the people Mm -hmm. Okay, back off a little bit because the people that you hate making small talk with. I, mean, I have my own dossier. The people I you mean, block, <laughs> <laughs> blocker, and Menos Mas. I showed up an hour early and I talked with everybody. Many people are saying yes. Well, this is the thing that worries me. And Greg Cody has a little something for your ass. And we saw how that went last week when Dominique or Do Dominique Fox, Do Dominique Fox, worthless. Uh, we saw how that went when Greg Cody disemboweled him. He's yeah. got something for you on this front. I've got to. Th I've got to. Is admit, it a floral wreath? The the dossier is impressive. Maybe we'll pay off some of these punishments, perhaps during our Sunday watch party with the audience, uh, because I do believe we need to correct that. But the thing that worries me now is that Mike has gotten the support to guts. I don't think you've noticed this. Now Hollywood's behind Mike on this stuff because his argument's pretty good. Have you seen what he's been doing on social media? Do you have any idea? Mike, I Ryan blocked him. Okay, Mike Ryan. Mike Ryan has got Hollywood behind him in a way big stars. that uh, many big celebrities are coming to my aid, totally uh, mm -hmm. motivated by just an injustice that's been happening here. Uh, Sir Elton John, uh, John Depp, who has been a very good friend of mine for a very long time, offered his support. Mm -hmm. uh, Tay Zonde of Chocolate Rain fame. Oh, uh, even the great Dean Blandino made an official uh, ruling on this. Mm. Our audience has united. I, at first, I said it was very split. Not but united, now, Mike. No, it's not no united, Mike. One hundred percent, my mentions have totally it's turned, not and united. that's not just because that's I blocked nonsense. everybody. That's that was nonsense. A no, Echo <laughs> chamber. Most Echo people, chamber. Most people want this overturned. Most people are even no. saying that Sugat's lost this bet because if you look at the spirit of the deal, mm -hmm. I was actually right. right. This bet was stolen yeah. from me. All right, Greg, do you have something here? I know well, you've got something. L let me just say, Mike's playing dodgeball over here. He's diverting responsibility he's not taking responsibility he's turned into the biggest blocker since dan blocker played hoss cartwright um he, he's, wow. he's just somebody wow. who's not taking responsibility <laughs>
You know what I mean? And and it it you know the hashtag. I didn't make this up. It's trending. The hashtag uh, shave your damn dome. It's trending on Twitter. Uh, people are marshalling themselves uh, against you, and it's something you need to accept and deal with. You're a liar. You're lying. Most yeah. people are tweeting hashtag stop the shave, not shave your damn dome. No, shave your damn no, dome no, is not, not, a not a real thing. thing. No, that's it's not, really not a real thing. thing. No, it's not a real thing. It's all over the wide world You don't know how they, you don't know how. It's all over the web. The wide world web? Whatever it's called, it's all over it. <laughs> it's spiking. It's spiking is what it's happening. Um, this isn't. Yeah, no, it's true. it's something. It's I don't a thing. Even, true. I don't even it's need true. A, a payoff before I were to presumably shave my head in an unjust way. But, but I need firm commitments. The show from owes. You all. The show owes. Firm, I need promises I that just, you're going to deliver for the audience. I need to see Dan naked with a baseball whoa. bat over his shoulders. I just dressed like a billionaire. Uh, astronaut, I am willing to do whatever the commissioner tells Except me I'm lined up to do. Except put your hands in spaghetti gloves, it would appear. Hey, bring the spaghetti. Can I'll I, do it but right if now. the outfits are here, I will wear Mike, them. I, that's, I, I mean, what am I supposed to do? Everyone, <laughs> that's why you haven't done it, Stugatz. Yeah. Not I because, outfit, not where, because where, where, you're shopping for a leopard suit. Not because I mean, you're a scheming weasel. <laughs> because we haven't gotten you the outfits. It's why you owe debts from six years ago. To write poetry, you need an outfit. Well, that's 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 fair. This is what I'm offering you, Mike Ryan, so that you can make this all go away because the audience is tired of it. I'm tired of it. Metal Ark is tired of it. Um, I'll g- if we're all going to pay punishments on Sunday, I'll I'll give you nude Prince Fielder photo shoot in exchange for all of this going away. Like in exchange, if we're negotiating here, you want to buy like out all mine go away? Well, I, not, you're going to buy me I, out. Why would I buy? I want the audience. Oh, very nice of you. I, like I was going to support you on that. So Dan does Prince Fielder. Mike <laughs> shaves his head, and this is behind the rest of us. No it. deal. Uh, done. No, done. It's, no, it's got to be a. Done. It's got to be a show. I yeah. believe that the show. Look how We've excited Roy is. I believe the show. We can bring the audience a payoff on Sunday. A payoff. By giving them some spaghetti hands, whatever, some things, some not only some reasons to watch the game with us on Sunday, but to get rid of some of these debts because I think Mike is right about this part of it, not the rest of the nonsense that he's saying, doing, polluting our show with this shit every day for for weeks and the company with your selfishness. Are you seeing? Are you saying that on Sunday at youtubecom slash and friends that there will be payoffs and we can actually get to the road of healing? Uh, I want this gone, though, Mike. Like, let's finish whatever the yeah, negotiations need to be. I want you guys to be... be men of integrity, but okay, I can't but get it all. We're going to give him something. And I would like that 20% pay reduction on an offer sheet to go away. Where did that come from? I mean, we're, ne- we're negotiating, I thought. Whoa. No, yeah. I thought we had a deal, I thought. I'm 50 50 on Sunday. Want to encourage the audience and the people who support us to support the new book, How to Be Perfect, The Correct Answer to Every Moral Question is available today. Mike Schur is joining us. He's written the book, and I don't mean to be paternal, and I'm sorry if it sounds this way, but I am legitimately proud that this man with so much going on in his life decided to tackle this project because the pandemic and some of the selfishness in the world bothered him so much that he decided to write a book about every philosopher throughout time, how they would answer every question. It's a philosophy book. It's a degree of difficulty book. It's got comedy in it, and I encourage you to buy it because it's available today. He also does for Metal Arc Media, the podcast with Joe Posnanski, and it's great. It's They're fun, and they're smart, and their sports analysis is excellent when they deign to talk about sports, which isn't all that often. So <laughs> I want you to support what it is Mike's doing because I'm telling you that this project of his was a big tackle. How's the reception gone so far, Mike? And thank you. We've got a lot of different things we want to do with you here, including something wonderful for Stugat. But uh, how is the project going with the book and how is it being received? First of all, thank you, Dad. That was very nice of you to say that you're proud of me. Um, it's going well. I mean, I don't know. We'll see in a, in a week or so, uh, I guess if people bought it and liked it, but, um, it was a labor of love. It came out of making the show the good place and thinking about this stuff and talking about it with some very smart and funny people for the better part of six years. And it was sort of, I, it was sort of like my exit interview from, from writing that show. It was like, here's everything I learned and I'm going to try to 
presented in a way that people can actually enjoy instead of the the original philosophy books, which are usually dense and opaque and unreadable. So uh, I'm I'm proud of it. I'm happy that I did it. It was not easy to do, although it did give me something to, to focus on during the uh, pandemic when I was locked in my house. But you say labor of love. It was also a labor born of fear and horror, correct? You're decent about these <laughs> things, but you, what is happening in this country is like you don't get more appalled than you get when you worry about the threats to democracy all around us. That's true, although I, I started writing it before the pandemic, before a lot of this stuff had happened. So it was a, it was a combo platter. It was like, I think this stuff is really important every day. And then also recently, especially in this country, some things have happened that have made it even more important. I tried not to make the book political or, or about the pandemic, although it would have been kind of easy to do that. It's really just about like looking around and trying to figure out maybe how we can all be like 1% better. It's, a, it's the money ball approach to morality, I guess. It's like, let's just try to get like 1% or 2% better in a bunch of different arenas in our lives, and then that a rising tide will lift all boats. That's the basic idea. So leftist liberal hackery. That's right, yeah. I mean, that's, you know, we assume that for me, right? That's, yeah, that's a given. A Hollywood elite. Uh, <laughs> Hollywood elitist, leftist, uh, yeah, socialist, uh, whatever. Sure, go ahead. Okay, so we're asking you to support the people who support us. And this uh, this podcast is climbing because it is a lot of fun. And, and, you know, he has smart people around that he has fun with. And this guy, we like to have fun here. This guy is somebody who has been doing comedy for a generation of people across Saturday Night Live, Good Place, and, you know, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, uh, Parks and Rec. So with that as your introduction, Stu do you know what's coming up here? Because one of the best moments we've had in the last year is when Mike Shore, during Freedom, did a ripoff of you, a copycat, an homage of just Stugatz's weekend observation. It was incredible. I was honored. I have thanked Mike a couple of times via text, but I have no idea what's about to happen. Yet. Mike, do you and want... And by the way, it was a SUI award-winning performance. Yes. Have, you know. Wow, congrats. <laughs> Congratulations. That's boy, yes. That's and so what do you want to tell <laughs> Stugatz? Because he does not know. We have teased him today saying we've got something delightful going on because that's as happy as I've seen him in a year when you were doing During Freedom... You, you one of a, a great comedy writer was basically doing a ripoff of Stu Gott. It uh, he was joyous. Yes. Well, you know I'm a huge fan of the show, and I listen to it. Uh, I listen to some part of it essentially every day. I've been listening to it every day in the new year in 2022, and I have made some observations here in January. So if you're interested. I can give you my January observation. Oh, we are. Oh we God. are so interested. Wow. But first, before you do it, we would like to show you what real comedy looks like, okay? <laughs> Greg, Cody, uh, uh, Greg Cody is ready. And now it is time to take a trip down memory lane. Here's your guy, Greg Cody, with Back in My Day. Honor. You know, Back in My Day, you kept your word. You paid your debts. It truly was as simple as that. Values were ingrained. You took your lunch pail to work every day. You kept the water bowl full for the old blood hunt on Grandpa's porch. And if you made a promise, you kept it. Nowadays, truth has been parsed. What is the truth? Where did it go? Since when was what's true open to debate? You know, the chairman of the board... So wise, he should have been called the chairman of the Bard, the great Frank Sinatra. He once said, what is a man? What has he got? If not himself, then he has not. I was lucky enough to speak with Frank about that before his passing. Ask him what it meant. He told me, gee, a man is two things, either or, but not both. He can be counted on to keep his word every time, no matter what, or he loses himself becomes weightless by degrees, and in time disappears, inconsequential as a dust moat. I told him, Frankie, that's heavy. You need to turn that into a song. <laughs> he said, I might, but right now we're about to release Oops, There Goes Another Rubber Tree Plant. The point is, truth and honor, a man's word, those are the bones of a person's integrity. You tell me you're going to do something, don't stutter and stammer and invent some lame excuse why you can't. But it's never that you can't, is it? It's that you won't. You bend and stretch the parameters of what truth is to suit your own convenience. Well, guess what? Truth is not elastic. It is harder than a diamond and just as valuable. 
The beauty of truth and honor is that as valuable as they are, they're free. Integrity, it costs nothing. Whether you are a pauper with a cardboard sign on a street corner or a king or a golden cane, the honor that emanates from you is up to you. While Bill Cody always said the four most important words in life were, do the right thing, and that I'd always know what that meant when I looked in the mirror. That was back when truth was not open to debate and when a man paid his debts. I'm Greg Cody, and that's how it was back in my day. Not funny at all. <laughs> it wasn't meant one to be. One of your worst. It, it, first it of all, it wasn't, serious, it wasn't yeah. meant yeah, to be, and it worst. wasn't about anybody in particular. Did you think it was about you, Mike? Because that's some serious... You said Golden Cane. There's a, only one of us here. That's serious some guilt uh, there if you thought it was about you. <laughs> I just went over the dossier. My conscience is clear. Is I it, won the bet is it by though? a lot. Yeah? <laughs> have you had all the mirrors removed from your house? Because that's what I've heard. That's what I've seen on the internet. <laughs> I have so many mirrors. In my yeah, house. okay. All right. You I t- won't after your head is shaved. I'll tell you that. <laughs> I told you he was going to disembowel you. <laughs> I loved it. He came for you the With same the way that he came Out for... Out old man. Put your hand in a spaghetti glove. <laughs> Dominique Foxworthless. <laughs> you buried him. Thank you. Now for some lesser comedy. That's your opening act, Mike Thank Shore. You. Are, are you ready for the Dip pressure? You hate to follow the king. You hate to follow him. I just... I want to make sure I understand something. Greg... Asked Sinatra what the lyric meant. Right. Sinatra told him, and then Greg said, "You should put that in a song." Yeah, yeah, you get I really it. Really did, yeah. and he called him G. Yeah, yeah. which part of uh, Frankie? I think. Yeah, what, which part <laughs> right. of that are you not understanding? Uh, sure. I just want to get the timeline down. Like, how did he hear the lyric before it was in the song? Is my question. Uh, well, it was. Uh, Oops! There goes another rubber tree plant. Is that what you mean? That's no, about the no. little ant that could carry a rubber matter. tree because okay. all the ants got this together. This is what you have to Oops, follow, goes Mike Schur. You're not going to be able to follow him, Mike Schur. He's got are high you, hopes, Mike. There, there are oh, high yeah, expectations baby. now on this segment. Yes. <laughs> You're coming out like after the Rolling Stones. Let's just sing again. Hopes, Two different songs. Okay, excellent Oops, work, guys. there goes another rubber tree plant. Yeah. All right. Trailers. For sale. Lorenzo. <laughs> Roots to let 50 cents. I'm Greg Cody, and that's how it was. Make it my day. You taught us so much. You're going to buy the shit out of Mike Schur's book after this. I wish the oh, Greg yeah. Cody Show podcast had its own song because then I could sing it right now. Just not fair that it doesn't. <laughs> what what podcast was that? Oh, the Greg Cody Show. Are you complaining about your <laughs> Who own is production? on this week? Yeah. It's unbelievable. I, Mike, I didn't mean to cut into your time. No, no, it's fine. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. <laughs> Delightful. We did. We talked to a robot umpire this week on the Greg Cody Show podcast. <laughs> Because robot umpires are coming to baseball, we managed to get one. Excellent! That's exciting. <laughs> he doesn't know the That's difference. That's exclusive. He does not I mean, know the difference when Chris Chris is speaking into his ear just to him. Right. So I wish you just let that play out. There's an isolated when, yes. That's fantastic. Yes. He, <laughs> he's, Sorry. He, 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 it's all on the air to him. He doesn't know. This is what you have to tune in for on Sunday. Because he's not going to know where he is. He's going to be on pills and Miller Lite, and we don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> Probably not at the same time. Yeah. You don't know that. I'm bringing some great food. But the the robot umpire is named uh, R2K2. And we have a (laughs) great conversation with him. Mike Schur's January observations. (laughs) It is time for Mike Schur to share his game notes. No one in the media will tell you what happened better than my boys. Mike Schur. (laughs) January observations is brought to you by DraftKings. Lost another six-team parlay and hoping to salvage your weekend by taking the under on Minnesota-Boston College women's ice hockey? (laughs) Try DraftKings. (laughs) Dan! (laughs) After a solid thrashing at the hands of the Alabama Crimson Tide, it looked like all was lost. But then came a thrilling national championship game where that defeat was avenged and a title was delivered to the Peach State for the first time in 40 years. And after that decisive victory, make no mistake about it, 
Mike Ryan's hair. <laughs> he is back. <laughs> Hollywood supports me. Mike's hair. Mayor. Hey, Mike. He excuses and explanations to get out of shaving your head when it's clear that you're supposed to shave your head. The endless appeals and explanations and filibusters that have gone on so long, we're all annoyed and kind of just want to let you win. Mike, the Stu Gotts is strong in you. You're playing both uh, charge. <laughs> it's a heady play by you, my friend. No pun intended. The show would be better without Mike's mullet. <laughs> Business in the front. Disaster in the back. <laughs> shave it. I'm just kidding. Never shave it, Mike. Why? Because bleep them, that's why. Hey, new Meadowlark Media drinking game. We all do a shot of tequila. Every time Dan Lebetard says the phrase, across decades, <laughs> we will all be dead. By 11 a.m. <laughs> hey, Dan, you can just say for 20 years <laughs> or for the last 30 years. You've been using the phrase across decades. <laughs> across two decades. <laughs> Chris Cody, fired by ESPN, rehired by Dan, wondering where he fits in at Meadowlark Media. And all it took for him to find his place was to royally screw up an ad read <laughs> so badly <laughs> that the company had no choice but to lean in and embrace the futility. <laughs> Sheets and giggles. Shiggles. <laughs> thorough incompetence. Thompidence. <laughs> and yet, he is by far the more talented Cody. Oh, oh wow. wow. What happened there? What happened? <laughs> Chris Whittingham. Good morrow, my fine sir. Prithee, didst thou see the Arsenal Liverpool fixture in the Carabao Cup semis? The Gunners had the run of play and were by a fair bit the better side. But the Liverpudlian swashbuckling attack proved too strong. And the Dioga Yoda brace proved the difference. <laughs> You're British. That's what I'm saying. Twas and You're a British person. <laughs> a person. Now, please don't tell Dan that we recently had a lengthy text exchange about international test cricket. <laughs> it's true. Witty. I recently listened to a local hour and heard David Sampson take a bold and brave stance in favor of coaches hitting their players on the head. <laughs> you rarely hear the pro side of that argument. So I salute you, David Sampson, for standing up for what you believe in, which in this case was that coaches should be allowed to hit their players on the head. You know what the I and David stands for, Dan? It stands for, I think it's fine when coaches hit their players on the head. <laughs> David Sampson appearing in a documentary about Woody Hayes. <laughs> Collision course. <laughs> That's right. I just dropped a Woody Hayes reference. <laughs> Cody loved it. I did. Because he's been the standard for coaches punching players on the head. Across decades. Across five decades. <laughs> yes. That's right, Dan. Great job by you. Jessica Smetana, the only person in the world whose top three sports interests are the Pittsburgh Steelers, the Notre Dame Fighting Irish, and someone named Lewis Hamilton. <laughs> and before you tell me that Lewis Hamilton is actually the biggest sports star in the world, because actually Formula One actually is actually the biggest actual sport in the world. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> Formula One. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Max Verstappen. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. You know what, Max Verstappen? 
Do it at the Aramco Grand Premio de España in Barcelona. <laughs> Guy was 15.84 seconds off the pace at the Aramco Grand Premio de España in Barcelona. Wants to call himself a champion? Please. <laughs> Verstappen couldn't even beat Valtteri Bottas at the Rolex Turkish Grand Prix in Istanbul. Max Verstappen? More like Max keeps stopping. <laughs> you know what the V in Verstappen stands for, Dan? I do not. Very far behind Valtteri Bottas at the Rolex Turkish Grand Prix in Istanbul. <laughs> Medi. <laughs> Roy Bellamy. Uh oh. How's it going, man? Doing good, Mike. Thanks. All right. Yeah. Everything yeah. all right? Yeah. Everything's all right. You've been a little quiet recently. <laughs> By recently, <laughs> Across I mean decades. since 2007. <laughs> Across decades, yeah. But here in January, you've been even quieter. Is it because the lightning are nipping at the ice cat's frosty paws <laughs> with the maple leaves right behind in third? It can be stressful being a fan of a sport that no one cares about. <laughs> You're right. I, I should know I watch baseball. <laughs> Speaking of which... Billy Gill. Uh oh. Pitchers and catchers report in like two weeks. Maybe. Assuming there is a baseball season. <laughs> which there definitely might not be. You know what the B in baseball stands for, Dan? I do not. It stands for bleeping it up. Yeah. As in the owners are really bleeping this up. They always are. Billy, don't worry about baseball being canceled. It's only about nine more months before you can go back to hosting a podcast featuring Jabba Chamberlain <laughs> and one of the lesser Gronkowski brothers. <laughs> Every morning in my podcast feed, I get somewhere around 60 new podcasts from you guys. The Local Hour. The Big Suey. South Beach Sessions. The podcast with Joe Posnanski and Michael The Schert. post game show. I'm getting there. The post game show. <laughs> Cinephile. Montgomery and Company. Off the Looking Glass. Something called the podcast with Joe Posnanski. <laughs> Drunk Amin El Hassan talking about basketball. <laughs> you know what the W in Meadowlark stands for, Dan? I do not. It stands for way too many goddamn podcasts. So true. DraftKings gave you $50 million. That's about $8 per podcast you put out. I know content is king, but slow the hell down. Speaking of hell, Art Bryles. Dan, those are the January Yes. Excellent. Amazing. Uh, Amazing. Thank you. Amazing. Uh, Amazing. Amazing. That's hard to do. That's I don't know whether you feel pressure or expectations on the stuff that you do because it is hard to continually meet those expectations. I want to talk to you about your Field of Dreams project, but can you explain to the people why this book matters to you? He like, should write comedy, I'm telling yeah, you. Yeah, he'd be pretty good. <laughs> he'd be, and he does, and he is in a, in a book. Again, I want to explain to you the degree of difficulty because – this has been a torturous process, correct, Mike? Like, this is just some real sculpting. You Have you ever worked on something like this? No, not, not like this. I mean, it took two years from beginning to end, although when I sold it, I was kind of wondering how I would have the time to do it, and then there was a pandemic. You might remember it was a pandemic that swept across the globe, and suddenly I couldn't leave my house. So it got easier for that reason. But, yeah, this was hard, mostly because... Almost everything I've ever done has been with a group of people in a room who you can bounce ideas off of and who can help you. And this was just me alone. So it was definitely more intimidating and uh, scary. But, um, you know, that's fun. That's like, that's why you do stuff. You do stuff because it's scary and challenges you. And the end product <laughs> you're feeling will be important? Do you want it to be important? Oh, don't don't use the I word. That's a bad that's a bad word. Don't say important. I think it could be of use to people in, in potentially because this is my analogy. I, I, like I read all this philosophy. I understood forty five percent of it. I had two philosophy professors, um, Todd May and uh, Pamela Hieronymi, who 
were on call who I could I could literally pick up like a red red phone and say what the hell is this existentialist talking about here and they would explain it to me and the analogy that I kept thinking was like you know the questions of how we can be good people on earth I think are always around like you the, the, you're you're always thinking about them at some level uh and the people like the smartest people who ever lived wrote how-to guides for how to do this how to live on earth and like be around other people and be a good person but their books are so long that it's like the analogy was that they they wrote recipes for like chocolate chip cookies that were delicious and helped you lose weight and their recipes were 600 pages long and written in german and no one wanted to read them so i felt like there it could be of some use to people to try to say like i'm going to read all this stuff and have very smart people explain it to me and then I'm going to try to like conversationally talk about it in a way that anybody can understand. That was the idea. So important is a, is a, is a bad word, but possibly of some use to people is, is my goal here. Philosophy for Stugat. Cliff, Cliff, <laughs> Cliff notes here, Stugat, you don't have to do all the work on being a moral person. Here's a handbook. I prefer not yeah. doing any of the work. Yeah. That's fair, uh, and we know that about you, and that's why we love you. But right. for the rest of us, there is a chance that you can get something out of this because it tries to boil down all of these complicated theories into ways that you can understand and, and possibly use in your real life. If you're familiar with Mike's body of work, I believe, well, maybe not more fun than whatever it is that you view the height of comedy writing as, but my introduction to Mike as a writer was on fire Joe Morgan, was him critiquing sports journalists in a way I had not seen anybody doing. Funnier, doing it largely anonymously. So I want to play some sound for you, Mike, as you've seen. You care about sports deeply. I want to get to your top five first base scoopers to see if your list is as good as Tim Kirkshin's. I just want to thank Mike for the January observations. I have to leave. I have to go speak to Jabba Chamberlain and a lesser Gronkowski brother. <laughs> okay. <laughs> See you later. Thank you for yeah. doing it. Thank you for announcing your <laughs> goodbye and getting an acceptance speech on what it is that Mike Scherr just did for you. Um, but I want to play the sound for you, Mike, because as a critic of sports journalism, here are, after that weekend of games, Skip Bayless, I did not know he was this kind of Tom Brady fan. I feel like he became this kind of Tom Brady fan recently. Just uh, He's very loud. All across decades and very hurt. And so here's the back and forth after Tom Brady loses. Uh, what is the name of their show? Undisputed? Undisputed with Skip Bayless and Shannon Sharp. And you're telling me Brady got outplayed. He did. He did. He got outplayed. It's the biggest bunch of bloating you've ever spewed. Matthew Stafford. Guess what Matthew Stafford had in the second yeah. half? It's my turn. Stop it. It is my turn because Matthew Stafford... Oh, that's really funny. Yes! Matthew you still Stafford, lost, Kim. He lost. I, you know what? I think it's my turn. It's, it's, you know, I let you spew all your baloney no, and start the show. I didn't say a freaking word. It's, it's not. Okay, lost. here we go. It is my turn. He still lost. <sighs> your thoughts, Mike? Well, I mean, he, he raised some good points. Uh, <laughs> cogent, cogent and thoughtful points. Um, <laughs> There's a lot to unpack there. Uh, I mean, it would take hours to really get into all of those arguments. Statistically, obviously, there's a lot to chew on. Um, I like that the show is called Undisputed. I think that's what I really take away from that because <laughs> the entire premise of the show is that everything is disputed <laughs> as loudly as possible. Um, but yeah, no, listen, that's great TV. That's that's uh, that's where we are now. And, and so the when you talk about fire joe morgan and the attempt to correct to make corrective measures in the way that we talk about sports it's clear that i'm a failure and thank <laughs> you for pointing that out well there are so many people at the trough and you were one of the first sort of looking at mainstream media and deconstructed it deconstructing it in sports analysis as you learned as a money ball guy and someone who cares about baseball and bill james abstracts that you was that was that sorry was that shannon just clapping in his face yes Is that what laughing was it was because he'd gotten him mad or hurt or yes that's all that was happening there play that sound again so so Skip, you can hear Skip Bayless say four or five times, you had your chance to speak. And yes, this is just Shannon enjoying you mad, bro. 
and you're telling me Brady got outplayed. He did. Baloney. He did. Got it's the biggest bunch of bloating you've ever spewed. Matthew Stafford. Guess what Matthew Stafford had in the second yeah. half? It's my turn. Stop it. It is <laughs> my turn it. because Matthew Stafford. Oh, that's really funny. Yes! Matthew you still lost, Kim. He lost. You know what? I think it's my turn. It's, you, oh, you know, I let you spew all your baloney. No, start the show. I didn't say a freaking no, word. Say it. It's not. Okay, he here lost. we go. It is my turn. He still lost. <sighs> it's just so great. I believe that uh, <laughs> I've had a lot of significant others who think that all of sports entertainment is that. Why is everyone shouting? Well, it kind of is, right? That's the problem. Like that's there's so so much of it is that. And Fire Joe Morgan happened before that whole like the only thing that was on PTI was on, but they never did that. Like they never clapped in each other's faces like that. Um that this is a it's gotten worse and worse. I mean, I guess the problem here is that you like saying Matthew Stafford outplayed Brady in the first half and Brady outplayed Stafford in the second half isn't that interesting. So what is interesting is two grown men screaming at each other, I guess. I don't know. I it's just so depressing. Like I just that just makes me depressed. Like that's just a sad. That's like a very sad audio clip. That's you, like a. That should be. It's like in. That should be like black and white footage of like a, of like a, a desolate landscape somewhere in in Scandinavia. <laughs> where you should play that audio over it. But it is black and white footage. <laughs> well played, sir. But I mean, that's what that's what they're doing. It's just two guys. Like, imagine that. Do you think that seventy-year-old man cares that a forty-four-year-old man lost in football on Sunday? Uh, uh, do you think uh, he cares knows? like that? Who knows what he cares about anymore? That's the problem. Like, you don't actually know. None of it seems genuine or authentic. It's just, it's just trolling. It's just like how many, uh, like how, I, I, I look when when Skip Bayless tweets things. It takes every ounce of strength in my body not to ridicule him for whatever it is that he's saying, because that's all he wants. And and I have fallen victim to it many times. Like if you go back through my feed, you'll find me subtweeting him or or quote tweeting him and just dunking on him because it's so absurd. And that but then you are lost in the whirlpool. That's all that is literally all he wants. All he wants, whether it's you playing the clip on your show and laughing at him or People like that's how that's his fuel. That's his medicine. And like, and it's hard not to give it to him because of the reasons you're bringing up, which is like, you don't care about this. This isn't real. You want to point that out, but he doesn't care because a, a hate click is the same as a, as a like click. All of that said, you actually do care about the top five first base scoopers of all time. When, if, if I, I don't know, how would you explain? I'm, I've tried to explain the audience and I think I've failed your conversations with Tim Kirkshin from your side of the conversation, I can't explain to the audience how deeply you two geek out on all things baseball. Yeah, well, the conversations, it should be noted, happen because I'm talking to you and then I say something about baseball and then you say, hang on a second, disappear, and when you come back, Tim Kirchin has been patched into the conversation against his will. The last time he was, like, walking his dog, I think, or maybe spending time with his grandkids and you just forced him to talk to me about baseball for 40 minutes. So well, wait, no, uh, I forced I, I, him. I forced him to talk baseball with you for one minute. You then <laughs> got started and did for 40 minutes because you two can't stop so when this you is start. A, you're blaming the victim. You're blaming the victim here. I had n I did not request to talk to Tim Kirchin. You forced Tim Kirchin to talk to me. <laughs> and by the way, it was delightful. And I'm glad you did it. But yeah, there's there are a few people in the world uh, that I think of as a rock star. Um, and most of them are not rock stars, but Tim Kirchin is one of those people. Like Tim Kirchin for me is what I imagine, you know, uh, Frank Sinatra is for Greg Cody <laughs> Thank or you. Mick Jagger is for, for, you know, my, my dad or something. So uh, it has been a real pleasure and honor to be able to, to geek out with him about baseball for a couple 40 minute chunks. Let's see uh, how, how comparable their lists are. Mike, what are you guessing here? Are you guessing that Mike Schur and Tim Kirkshin have comparable lists? We'll have a lot of uh, duplicates here? Yeah, like-minded individuals, those I, two. I bet Kirkshin's list is older than mine because uh, I'm guessing he's going back to the 50s and 60s and stuff. But um, you want my top five? So should we get his top five, and then if he has any of the same, we'll say it? Yes, let's, okay. uh, let's do this here. Would you like to hear Tim Kirkshin's top five, or would you like to just go? <laughs> No, I'll, let me hear it. I, I, I wrote mine down. I'm, I'm not going to change, I, but I'm, I'm curious what his are. Number five, Mike Squires. <laughs> <laughs> it's already better than mine. 
<laughs> it's already so much better than my list. <laughs> That's minute. amazing. <laughs> what just happened to you? What just happened? I haven't heard the name Mike Squires in 20 years. That's what happened to me. That's fantastic. <laughs> Number four, Vic Power. Oh, my God. <laughs> Belly he's, laughing. I mean, he's tickling him. He's, you're tickling. He's crushing you with his list. Number Vic, three. Vic Power, we played for in the 50s and 60s. It's exactly what I said. He was played for the Kansas City A's in like the 50s and 60s. Like, how do, how in the world are you going back that far? That's crazy. Number three. JT Snow. Ah. Number two. Don Mattingly. And number one, according to Tim Kirkshin. Keith Hernandez. He went all old school. I'm guessing, man, are you going to have anyone from the modern day? Anyone. Am I? Let's see what we've got. All right. You want mine? Here we go. Number five, JT Snow. Nice. Number four. <laughs> Number four, Casey Kochman. Oh, wow. Stugatz predicted that Kirkchen would have him in his top five. Kirkchen only gave him top ten. It's correct? too bad he's talking to Jobber Chamberlain right now. <laughs> yeah, and <laughs> at least he told us he was leaving. Number three. Number three, Mark Teixeira. Wow, high praise for Teixeira. Number two. Number, number two, Doug Mankiewicz. That's a good one. We thought Stugatz Stugatz's <laughs> list might be better than Kirkshin's. It's it's a little bit Stugatz and everyone. It sounds like Stugatz came closer to the list than Kirkshin did. Number one, Mike Schur. Number one, it pains me to say it, Keith Hernandez. They both said it. Wow, they we agree. The Ten straight one, yeah. gold gloves we yeah, looked up yesterday. They, looked up. they both agreed. Yeah. It has been determined. Keith Hernandez, the greatest scooper in first base history. Would you describe say, him? Uh, let, me, let me say this, though. Keith Hernandez did this really annoying thing because I hated the Mets. I hated the Mets more than the Yankees in the 80s because of 86. But Keith Hernandez would do this annoying thing when one of his infielders would make a fairly routine play and after Hernandez made the out, he would point at the infielder like, nice play. And it was like a two hopper to short, and it used to drive me nuts. I had to get that off my chest. Would you describe him as a hard-charging first baseman? I mean, I think every team needs a hard-charging first baseman. Amen. Yeah. You, do you have a top five hard-charging first baseman? <laughs> you can find out things like that. I will request this on behalf of the audience, Joe Posnanski and Mike Schur on – Another one of the interminable Metal Lark podcasts. You can find them breaking that down. I want to. I want a top five list of hard charging first baseman. Before we get to that, though, Mike, uh, how much are you sweating Hall of Fame release day? I'm sweating it a lot. Ortiz is at like eighty four and a half percent, and the the unknown ballots based on Ryan Thibodeau's tracker often are harder and harsher on suspected PED users than the known ballots. So. I think it's going to be razor thin, but I think he's going to make it. I think he's going to make it, and it's going to be, uh, it's going to be close. But I, I'm, I care about that more than the release of my book. No joke. Like I, that's the thing today that is occupying most of my mental energy. And tell me everything that you want to happen, and what's going to piss you off, and what needs to happen on the day that your book is being sold. That you care whether or not these people get into the Hall of Fame or not. Well, I care about Ortiz because he's probably my favorite player of all time, and because I think that if the point of the Hall of Fame is to tell the story of baseball. I don't think you can tell the story of baseball from 2003 to the present without David Ortiz. The weird question, of course, is that it's Clemens and Bonds' 10th time on the ballot, same with Schilling. You can certainly make the argument you can't tell that story of baseball without them either. And I don't think any of them is getting in. Uh, Schilling almost certainly isn't. He's lost votes compared to last time. Bonds and Clemens are right at the line, but again, the unknown ballots are often tougher on them than the known ones. So I think we're going to end up in this really weird place where probably the greatest hitter of all time and probably the greatest pitcher of all time, neither one of them is in the Hall of Fame. That doesn't make any sense. Like, they, someone needs to step in at some point and say, like, here's how we're doing this now. Like, the, we cannot just pretend this didn't happen. We can't pretend this era wasn't real. We can't keep all these guys out of the Hall of Fame. We have to figure out some kind of solution. My pitch on the podcast, one of Meadowlark Media's interminable number of podcasts, my pitch was that you basically say if you are a steroid user uh, or, or any equivalent kind of cheating, you pay a 10-year penalty where you can't even begin to uh, get votes for, 10, for 15 years after you retire, and then you, the voters are not allowed to take it into consideration. I don't know if that's the right solution, 
but that is a solution and someone somewhere needs to come up with a solution because otherwise we're going to be in a situation where we the museum that's about celebrating baseball won't have like 10 of the greatest players of all time and it doesn't make any sense do you think steroid tainted guys like clemens and bond should eventually make the hall of fame uh yes i do <laughs> mike see you later where, where did that where did that come from <laughs> It's, it's my disembodied dad. voice. It's going back into the old file before you listen to the show. This is uh, the cliches <laughs> across decades. I, across decades, the, the sports yeah. radio cliche question that Greg never listened to any of the answers, but he just wanted to ask the question to get it, his voice out there. Do you think steroid tainted guys like Clemens and Bond should eventually make the Hall of Fame? <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> um, Mike Schur, congratulations. New book, How to Be Perfect, the correct answer to every moral question. It is available today and the podcast. I'm encouraging you. Where's to- our hard-charging first baseman? I mean, I'll throw Cabrera in there. Um, I'll throw Prince Fielder in there. T- you know, Teixeira was a pretty big dude. I'll throw Teixeira in there. Um, Steve Balboni. So Balboni is great. Oh, uh, does Greg Luzinski count, or is he more of a DH? More of a DH outfielder uh, <laughs> and terrible at, at, at outfield. Uh, well, I'll throw him in there anyway. Balboni's good. Uh, who am I missing? How about, uh, oh, you know what? Fred McGriff. Skinnier, but hard charge. Prime dog. Uh, Mo Vaughn. Mo Vaughn's a hard charge. Mo Vaughn. Yeah, I miss Mo Vaughn. Shoot. All right. <laughs> Hank Greenberg. Hank Greenberg. Right. Hard charging first baseman. I mean, I'm a Hall of Famer. I mean, and I'm a Hall of Fame voter. When I say Hank Greenberg, it means something. You are. Who did you vote for, incidentally? Because uh, Mike Scher says something should be done about this. And I was thinking to myself, I wish I had a vote. Uh, You know what? Mike had a good idea about the 10 year penalty. I also have an idea that I've floated, Mike, and this is serious. I'm, I'm curious what you think of it. I think that. You don't ignore the guys like Bonds, Clemens, and I include Pete Rose in this conversation. But when you vote them in on their bronze plaque for all time, there's a line there that explains why it took them a while to get in, what their imperfection was, what the scandal was, the shadow. What do you think of that idea? I have heard that idea from a couple people. I think it's, I mean, it's something, and it might be the right answer because, again, it's supposed to be a sort of nonpartisan museum that just sort of explains history. It does seem a little odd or something uh, to to have it memorialized on their plaque, although it also seems odd not to. I don't know. I mean, it's a mess, but that's why you need, that's what, these are the things, the kinds of things that a uh, friend of the podcast, Rob Manfred, should really be doing, right, is like, he should be, someone should be saying like, here's how we're going to handle this. And the problem has been no one has ever had that conversation. They just all closed their eyes. Selig and Manfred have closed their eyes. Everybody's closed their eyes and just pretended it didn't happen. And then they're waiting for it to go away. It's never going away. We're going to be talking about this forever until they figure it out. Ortiz used, right? I don't think he did, Dan, you jerk. I don't think he did. I mean, uh, he used something that got uh, that where he popped up on that allegedly anonymous 2003 test, but like you can't hold that against him. It was illegally leaked, and no one ever knew what it was even what he was even charged with. And then he played from 2003 to whatever it was 2017, and was part of the testing regiment that was instituted because of those anonymous tests. And he never tested positive. So did he? I don't know. Maybe he did. Maybe he didn't. But they at least had a process in place for testing guys and he was tested God knows how many times and he didn't test positive. So if he used stuff, well, then he used stuff, but he actually lived in the era and played in the era where they were actively testing guys all the time. He never tested positive. That's his, that's all you can kind of do, I think, to to determine whether somebody used or not. He was on uh, the Mitchell report, and I also thought the thing around him, and I don't know how you do this because Randy Johnson, Guillermo Moda, there are body types out there that you cannot – say this about but ortiz's numbers post 30 years old are something that you don't see like paul o'neill very few hitters get better after 30. yeah and and like is it suspicious of course it's suspicious every guy who played in that era who had a career like that i mean not like that but a a sustained career well i mean his one of his best offensive seasons what's his last season his last season it was he was 41 or whatever and had an incredible year so you can be suspicious all you want, but if a guy played in an era where they had an actual testing policy with actual punishments in place, 
and he didn't test positive, then you just kind of have to do that. It's not, you can't punish it. You can't test a guy, have him test negative and still punish him for it. It doesn't make any sense. Good talking to you, Mike, and congratulations. Really am happy for you. This uh, is a very fulfilling thing to have your book out there and have them consume something you've worked so hard on. So uh, happy for you today. Thank you, buddy. Good to talk to you all. Happy 56th birthday to Mike Ryan, original nemesis, Mark Schlereth. And happy birthday to him. I don't care. Good luck. Mike Ryan, then a cocky kid on Twitter, went after Mark Schlereth about some of his analysis, and Mark Schlereth came over to him in the most Mark Schlereth of ways on social media and asked, do we have a problem here? And Mike Ryan uh, ran back into the shadows. No, sir. No, sir. Ran ran back into the shadows, scared of Mark Schlereth, (laughs) and just to lob feces from afar, scared as soon as Mark Schlereth asked the question that will make all of us, all of us big men, uh, all of our big mouths and big men back down. Do we have a problem here? Nope. You've got a grill in your hand. You would probably throw me or you've got a spatula in your hand and you would throw me on your grill and uh, cook me up. So I'm sorry. I've never ir- even answered your question. I just ran away. I deleted <laughs> all the tweets. I'm sorry to have upset you, Mark Schlereth. Uh, just <laughs> you got him to the point. It's really the place you want to get your dad right up until he gets to, do we have a problem here? Nope. I'm going to go into my room as a teenager, close the door <laughs> and not invite any more of these problems. But this guy from Twitter does want to invite these problems. He's at 305 Ricardo, and in response to changing playoff rules, he says in all capital letters, wrong, play defense, no participation trophies, team sport, get it together. Is that guy? Thank you, eighth grade phys ed teacher at 305 Ricardo, Wrong. I mean, I Wrong. feel like the argument could be made that the Bills defense needed to get it together in overtime. It's understandable that we're always having that conversation after playoff games because everything is heightened. Stakes matter more. More eyes are, are watching the game. But the coin toss isn't that important during the regular season. The data would suggest that. However, in the postseason, there have been 11 instances in which there have been games that go to overtime. Coin toss winner has won 10 out of the 11. And the one time that it didn't win, there was a famous pass interference that wasn't called that made a a rule be reviewable for a year until the referees decided to tank it and make sure that that would never happen again. I'm curious as we watch all of this, because as some of this stuff has been fast forward during the pandemic with greed and commerce and get that 17th game, I don't know if the audience has wondered about this. In basketball, in the NBA, when LeBron James is trying to play all 48 minutes, it's a test of the limits of the human body. Would you be willing to buy in on an 11 coin flip sample size that by the time you've reached the end of a playoff game, Everyone is so tired and broken at the end of a season and fighting and fighting and the 49ers are limping off the field, the best of them in the last minute, that this game tests the human limits to a point that you're not going to be able to play much defense at the end of an overtime game, at the end of a brutal, brutal season. Are you willing to do that with an 11-game sample size? That these sports are all testing human limits And you can't go multiple overtimes. You have to have an ending. You can't go three and four overtimes before it just becomes carnage. Yeah, and it becomes unfair because presumably, in most cases, unless it happens in the Super Bowl, one of the teams is going to have a a really big game coming up. I think the the rule is is fine. It's the best of the options. I don't want to see it become college football. While it's a small sample, though, that 10 out of 11, and it should be 11 out of the 11, And I think the reason why the math is like that compared to the regular season is you're not having a bad team win a coin toss where in the regular season you can count on, okay, yeah, the Detroit Lions may win this coin flip, but the chances of them marching down on the Pittsburgh Steelers on that first drive and hanging up a touchdown to end this game aren't nearly as likely as the Kansas City Chiefs doing that to, yes, admittedly another good team in the Buffalo Bills, but a good offense is 
in all likelihood going to win that coin toss. Yeah, 11 uh, coin flips is not a tiny sample. I mean, it's something that gets your attention when it's 10 to 1 and should be 11 to nothing. And the, the coin flip that begins the game is utterly meaningless because the one who wins the coin flip defers 90% of the time. But the idea that a coin flip, that a totally random coin flip w would go a large way disproportionately to deciding a playoff game, uh, any game, let alone a playoff game, is ridiculous. It should be, the rules should be let changed. Me, let me ask Each this team question. should have at least one possession. Let me ask this question on the stat. Does that mean opening drive is deciding the game? Or is the ball going back and forth and then probabilities are playing a role here? Because that's a different result. If if all 11 are the game ends on the first drive, then maybe I can take that sample and support my macro point of everyone is just done by the end of one of those games. Because it's not just like all the other games. This is clawing, scratching, desperation of the position the Chiefs are in when they're down 13 and they're trying to save what their bodies have been fighting for all season long. You're getting the best of what everyone's got left. What's the answer to my question? Is it... 11 immediate first strike scores where the team scores a touchdown and then the game's over and how, how disappointing my guy never got to touch the ball. Seven of those 10 teams scored the sudden death touchdown on the opening drive. It's a courtesy of Ian Rappaport that got it from NFL research. And it's interesting because over the course, I saw this from Lewis Riddick over the course of regular season and the playoffs, it's only 21 and a half percent of teams have scored on the opening drive after the coin toss touchdown ends the game. So the regular season is overweighted there because it's 100 and I think it's 163 total. And we're talking about 11 games in the playoffs. So the lion's share of the regular season is that you're not having teams score on that opening drive. But in the playoffs, all of a sudden becomes a much bigger determinant in the outcome of the game. And it's flatly because teams are better than most of the teams headed into overtime during the regular season. So maybe you could look at something for playoff postseasons because while we're all saying it's small, it, to your point, Greg, recent history would suggest you, you win that flip. 70% of the times you're marching down the field and I, winning the game. I also think the reaction is largely based off of, and I will admit to this because I had the knee-jerk take, let's fix the rules. It's largely because of our quarterback-centric, yeah. offense-centric view of the game, that the offenses are the ones that are determining the outcome, not the defense, especially in that game where the two quarterbacks went toe-to-toe -to -toe over the final five minutes of the game and it was football played on another plane. And so you want to see them determine it, not only one offense getting a chance to have a go. One of the things that you heard me marveling about yesterday, just at the level of scientific training that goes into military schools for millionaires producing Sunday warriors who could be super disciplined on the field. I'm not talking about the Antonio Brown stuff. I'm talking about on the field, route running, all of that stuff that has to be precise that the beauty of the weekend with all the storylines and walk-offs and everything else, that at the end, when what might have been the two best teams, Buffalo and Kansas City, play a game at the height of offense being played as we've ever seen it, 13 seconds left. And this is how Michael Irvin, I remember Michael Irvin defining discipline this way back in the Orange Bowl in the, in the 90s, saying discipline isn't, Whatever you think it is. Discipline is my body's done in the fourth quarter. I got nothing left. I'm on the defensive line. And I've been car crashing all game long. And now fourth quarter humidity coming down on me. I'm spent. I've been training for this all week, but I got nothing left in my tank. And now the quarterback goes hard count on me. And I know not to jump. I do not jump on that hard count because no matter how fatigued I am, my mind is right. That Travis Kelsey with 13 seconds left might have broken off that route because him and Patrick Mahomes just knew. Just knew, got to go inside. That evidently, that wasn't the call. They just both saw. They know from the training of being specimens at the height of the sport every day. Meetings, 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 meetings. It's no fun. It, it's Ray Lewis says they pay me for Sundays. Sundays are fun, but that week is not fun. It's training, 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 training. So 13 seconds, survival, war mentality, we're generals training military school. You're not too tired to know, Travis, don't break that to the left. You got to break that to the right. You got to know that because we've been training it across three seasons with you two at the top of what offense can be, Mahomes and Kelsey. That was a audible, correct? That yeah, was no, they totally improvised that route. They they both talked about it in the in the post game press conference, and it was fascinating because I was talking about look, these are teams that have 
uh, really drill down these practice routines in this scenario. And you have two guys as calm as can be at the line of scrimmage, recognizing the defense that they went up against on the first play of that drive. And in the huddle, Travis Kelsey says, hey, Patrick, if they line up that very same way, I'm going to take the gap that the defense is presenting me. And if you go and watch that play, that big play to Travis Kelsey, you can hear him. at the line, Patrick goes, do it, Kels, do it, Kels. And Kelsey gets his cue and he just runs a seam route. Uh, Think right about up. that. That's incredible. Think about the precision of Andy Reid offense. Uh, we need to hire Biennemi. Those guys are doing it different than everyone else. And at the end of it, it's against just, Buffalo, it's, it's Omaha. Just, it's it's Kels, do it, Kels. Kels, just do that thing. Just do that thing. Yeah, no, go to the car and, and run a button route. Like, it's just, it was backyard football. And it's just phenomenal that you have those talents to be like, yeah, we have these plays for these moments, but the defense is showing us this gap right here in the middle of the field. I'm going to take that when everyone's hair should be on fire. When when other teams find it difficult to find the official, they're just casually being pick up. No, and how exhausted does Kelsey have to be after what he has done all game? When I'm mm-hmm. talking to you about the tests of the human limits, like that, I'm watching that at the end, and I'm like, man, oh, man, they're going to go at the end. They're going to finish Buffalo when Josh Allen is the height of whatever youthful thoroughbred exuberance is, trying to come for everybody's stuff. They're going to be able to throw in precision, in precision against an exhausted defense because they've won the coin flip to Kelsey in the end zone because, okay, how are you going to stop that exactly? Those two guys – those two guys with that chemistry, leading receiver in the league last year as a tight end. What are you going to do after you've been chasing Tyreek Hill around all game? After you've been chasing Tyreek Hill around all game, what do you do? Squib kick. <laughs> Great stuff. Perfect. <laughs>